Good morning and welcome to the 12th meeting of the Education Skills Committee in 2019. Apologies have been received from Gordon MacDonald and today we have Gil Patterson as substitute at the meeting. Agenda item one is decisions on taking business in private. Um, agenda item, we'll consider whether to take agenda item three, four and five in private today and whether to take future considerations of the evidence of subject to choice inquiry in private. Uh, members can, can take items three, four and five in private content. and content to take future consideration on the evidence and subject choices in private. Content. Thank you very much. Agenda item two is uh, the first evidence session on committee subject choices inquiry. Well, we'll hear from two panels of witnesses today. The first panel are representatives from Education Scotland. Um, before we begin the final, the formal evidence session, um, can I take this opportunity to give a sincere vote of thanks on behalf of the committee to all those who have engaged with the committee on the inquiry so far. We've received over uh, 1,100 survey responses from teachers and hundreds of responses from parents and young people, and these will be published over the course of the inquiry. I'd also like personally thank those who attended the MSYP setting workshop with me on subject choices and also the young people who have been part of the lively discussions hosted by our outreach team on the inquiry. The contributions are very valuable and the time taken to make them is very much appreciated by the committee. Can I welcome this morning uh, Gail Gorman, Chief Executive and Chief Inspector of Education from Education Scotland, Alan Armstrong, Strategic Director, Joan Mackay, Assistant Director, and Jenny Watson, Senior Education Officer. Um, can I see that most of the questions will be directed to yourself, Ms Gorman, if you could then nominate someone to take the questions if required. Um, as we are under quite a time constraint today, we have a second panel, so um, we want to get through as many of the questions as possible. Um, and can I um, invite questions beginning with Jenny Goldruth? And good morning to the panel. Um, excuse me, can we have just a very brief opening statement? Oh, I mentioned that. Okay, I think Apologies. Yep, yep. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, and, and thank you all for the invitation to uh, for us to come and give evidence um, this morning. This, of course, is something very central to, to Education Scotland and something we're, we're working with currently. So someone once said, in order to um, set sail on a journey of discovery, you first have to leave the safety of the shore, and that seems quite appropriate um, for this inquiry. So the teenagers leaving our schools and colleges in the next couple of months have had the whole of their educational career involved in Curriculum for Excellence. The future they face in the 21st century is different from what I experienced at school, and I'm sure um, many of you will, will, will agree with that. As a nation, we design curriculum for excellence to be flexible, to enable the education system and the children and young people within it to adapt to a very rapidly changing world and the skills that are needed to thrive in it going forward. This is still a real untapped potential of CFE, and we need to do this to set it free to enable that to happen. We should not be surprised that our young people have adapted and are revelling in their CFE experiences. They're expected to make more choices about their learning, their careers than we ever had to and are used to, and they expect more options to choose from. In an ever-changing system and world where the pace of change is unprecedented, in their lifetimes the pace of change has been unprecedented. So there's much debate on the topic of subject choice. Um, what I'm clear about is that we should not lose sight of what young people are telling us and what they want from their education. Um, it's little surprise that many of our young people um, don't express concerns about not having uh, enough qualifications. Instead, they more, we more frequently hear complaints for them about too much focus being placed on traditional qualifications at the expense of innovative pathways through their final years at schools, the years which are, in fact, the preparation for the world of work. Um, Convener, there's still work to do in achieving this for our young people. We are still seeing too many settings where the focus is still on a one-year qualifications ladder, uh, a drive to the next batch of national qualifications, hires or advanced hires, and too often in the traditional subjects that you and I may have studied. There are a wealth of courses and programmes available, um, same level as hires, certified by SQA, but many others. And there's no doubt that we need more help to support parents, employers, and many others understand these options and changes that are available. 
It's not easy to change the mind shift and the mindset of a system such as education, but collectively we need to do it. Having said that, encouraging evidence has been highlighted in our latest thematic inspection report on curriculum empowerment published at the end of last week. The good news is that almost all head teachers and schools feel empowered to make decisions about their curriculum. Almost all are now revisiting the broad general education to plan better aligned learning pathways between particularly the BGE and the senior phase. And we also found that in secondary schools, teachers are concerned about the number and the timing and changes of the SQA courses over the past few years, which have impacted on planning for progression. We've also found that schools, particularly in rural areas, though not not totally solely in rural areas, continue to find it difficult to recruit teachers. Whilst we do see schools taking creative solutions to their position, this situation can, and in some cases does, limit opportunities to lead extensive curricular improvement, and in some instances provide a local curriculum that fully meets the needs of the children and young people that they serve. The Education Governance Review strengthened the remit of Education Scotland and we recognise our role in now taking the sector forward to the next phase of Curriculum for Excellence and indeed have been developing with partners a refreshed narrative for CFE to support teachers into the next phase in a changed and changing system. We've been reorganising over the past six months. I'm excited about our new regional structure, which took up its position two days ago um, to support schools and local authorities and regional improvement collaboratives. And we're also excited about our plans to engage with thousands of teachers in next academic session on improvement topics, of which an innovative curriculum design is one of our highest priorities. The debate I do want us to have is about how we ensure our young people can make the choices that they want, choices which are often from a much, much wider range of options than the traditional academic subjects, delivered in the traditional way that formed the mindset of many of us. The question I have is how do we deliver the greater choice and personalisation that our young people need? And the answer is a much broader one than just five, six or eight. We need to ensure a modern curriculum for excellence is delivered. Our children and young people deserve and expect no less. Thank you, convener. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll move to Ms. Goldruth. Thank you very much, uh, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, I'd like to go back to um, the, the thought about curriculum empowerment, um, Gail, that you, you spoke about um, in your opening statement there and the broader curriculum offer, because I do think there's a bit of a tension between the line from the SQA and what we're being told by Education Scotland. So I just want to try and get this right in my head. Every National Five course is 160 hours notionally from the SQA, a maximum of 22 and a half hours of class contact time every year for, for every class teacher. There are 38 teaching weeks in the year, so that in total is 855 hours. So if you look at those hours altogether, you can only teach five subjects in a teaching year, according to SQA guidelines. So there is a tension there between the ethos of BGE, which is meant to be until the end of S3, and what the SQA are advocating. So I want to ask, therefore, who takes responsibility for curriculum design? You know, is that being driven by local authorities? Is it Education Scotland or is it SQA? Um, the schools design courses. The SQA set qualifications and they set standards. And their notional 160 hours um, for an SQF related 24 points in there um, is based on notional learning. Now that does not all have to take place with teacher contact. So the schools then design courses and design the timetable, if you like, around about um, the young people in the school and the pathways that they need to move towards the qualifications. And that's why we've seen schools over recent years settling on anything between five, six, seven, eight, sometimes experimenting for, for year to year. Um, to make sure that the, the young people, building on what they've learnt from S1, 2, 3 and in primary school, are ready to move into that senior phase, ready to have the right amount of, of learning and teaching in their S4. The other point that many schools are looking at is that they're moving away from that rather stale diet of examinations in S4 and then in S5 and then in S6. Um, and we know that increasing numbers of young people are staying on from S4. In fact, two thirds now leave from S6. Um, and the numbers moving into S5 and not leaving in S4 have moved from, I think, only about one in six young people 10 years ago stayed on um, into S5. Now there's one in nine. And those learners, that gives the schools opportunities to design courses over more than one year. 
So we are seeing young people now beginning to take a mix over courses of one year or two years, sometimes stopping after a year and sitting examination, maybe in two or three subjects, whilst they're continuing with other exams right over um, the, the two years as schools design the courses. I take that point, but I suppose my point would be is that it's impossible to timetable more than five subjects in an academic year unless you start earlier. So I, I'm trying to get to the, the understanding what Education Scotland's advice would be to schools then. You know, are you saying that BGE should not start until August or are you saying you can start gathering evidence in, I suppose, the Easter term, you know, starting about this time yeah, of year? Yeah. Young, young people move through uh, the progression over S123 at, at different rates. Now, as I said, 160 hours, that notional time, is the learning to reach a qualification. It does not say that learning has to take place after the start of S4. So you could, for example, have a very able young person in S2 who is totally inspired by a novel and really gets deep into that novel, the understanding, the craft of the author, etc., etc. And that's the kind of skills and experiences that might actually be looking at National 5, perhaps even higher once in a while. But the teachers do not then apply SQA qualifications to that. It's about that natural flow of learning and teaching. You'd have an able violinist, an able artist over S123, you know, producing really good work in aspects of their learning. That then enables the, the school at the end of S3 and the teachers to say, where is each of the young people in here? And what are their needs over the next year, two years, three years? I suppose, I mean, looking at the evidence, the Royal Geographical Society say an obvious solution to both increase pupil choice and reduce time pressure is to make clear that subject matter can be taught in S3. And that is supported by the Scottish Association of Geography Teachers who advocate a return to the 222 model, which is obviously in direct uh, contrast to the, the ethos of BGE. Um, what's Education Scotland's take on that? So just to say, we are, we've been quite clear about, if we're thinking about the context that we set there about empowerment, mm -hmm. that actually it's about the local schools and the local community mm -hmm. and the school leaders thinking about what's the best option for the young people that they work with and serve. Now, in some areas, that might be um, looking at um, changing the fluid nature of um, the senior phase. It might be starting some qualifications for some young people in S3. And in fact, we have case studies that show a variety of approaches to curriculum. But you know, if you're looking for us to say that Education Scotland says you must all do this and this, that would be inappropriate. What we're saying is here is some best practice. Here's where we've seen this make the right choices for young people at the right time in their community. But actually, you have to look at your curriculum rationale, look at the learners within your school over time as well. You know, we don't want a static curriculum because our young people are not static, they're dynamic. We want a dynamic curriculum. So our job is to very much to say, here's good practice and here's why it was good practice in that context. And it could be variable and it may vary over time. And actually, here's another element of, of, of excellent practice that might have a different curriculum design. What we need is the nation to engage in that debate and to really, really, as professionals, think about what's the best option, and particularly for different subjects as well, where the learning demands and the need for the teacher one-to-one -one interface can, can vary across a course as well. Yeah. The qualifications. That, the qualifications is your senior phase. So the learning can, can progress through primary school and secondary school, um, but the qualifications that young people take, that's what begins over S4 and 5 and 6. And the learning that takes place towards that can determine the course choices and the levels that young people then move into when they sit the qualifications over S4, 5, 6. But we're not saying that you cannot teach any element of National 5 course until August of S4. Okay. That, that would not be appropriate. I understand that because I used to teach national qualifications, but I do have a concern about the variability across the country in terms of the offer at BGE level. So some of the evidence we've received shows that inspection evidence shared uh, showed that young people in S1 can be studying as many as 15 subjects. You know, that's a lot of different subject areas. Do you honestly believe that the BGE is preparing our young people adequately for a move into NQ level, given that broad variability of subject offer in the BGE? Not yet. Um, but it's a work in progress. And um, this year alone, the increase and the requests for help and support with BGE, not only in S1 to S3, but across the transition, uh, period has increased significantly from schools and that's some of the work that um, Jenny and I and our small team are supporting with just now. Um, people have turned their minds to BGE and they're looking at it um, more holistically than before. And I think it's important to remember that 
when we talk about the 13 subjects bit, that's the way it's organized in secondary. It's 13 different bits of the curriculum. It's also important to remember that youngsters who have been going through primary and seven years of primary, plus often two years of early, early education, they have already encountered a lot of these, what we call subjects in secondary. So they will have studied history and they will have studied chemistry and they will have studied to varying degrees before they ever come into S1. So the issue in S1 is far more about um, the transition into the type of, the way learning is organized. That's the best way I can put it. So it is a shock to go from um, P7 into 13 different teachers or 13, and that's the point that's been made there. It's not that the subjects necessarily are new to them. You know, the actual learning, it's, it's the way learning is packaged. So people are recognizing that, and there's, a, as I said, um, significant interest and focus on BGE at the moment, while also developing senior fees. So that's, that's a place we're at, I think, um, nationally. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Scott? Yes. Thank you for your candour, because um, if I've got anything from that, from your answers to Jenny Garuth, it's that Education Scotland's role is, as you've very fairly described this morning, not to impart um, firm guidance or dictate from on high. It's very much to do what? Can, to work in partnership with the system. We're working with Scotland's educators for Scotland's young people, and we are um, there to develop good practice, to evaluate impact on the system, mm -hmm. to share evidence-based research, and to make sure that we are creating the network that creates a pre professional learning community across Scotland, and particularly in a changing and evolving empowered system. It's critical that that role is about that facilitation, that celebration of best practice, and the challenge um, around where we see ineffective practice and mm. actually making sure that as a system that's addressed. So uh, that's very fair. So how do we assess, how does an education committee or indeed an education minister assess what's happening? If there's no, by definition, you've described a, a myriad of ways in which schools can take forward both curriculum and, um, and the teaching of that curriculum. Um, how do we know effectively what's happening? So there are a number of ways. So some of it is through um, thematic inspections, which we've restarted this year, um, particularly this year with a focus on empowerment. So we've got a series of three of them, but we're also um, in the summer term about to conclude a thematic inspection on mathematics and the teaching of mathematics across all phases in Scotland and its successes and weaknesses and um, raise some big questions about that and what we need to do as a nation around that. So there's thematic inspections, there's then the individual school inspections, which then we collate up into an annual report, again, identifying key themes. But there is also the ongoing um, regional work where we're able to um, do a deep dive into the system and actually say, we think there's an issue about, um, if I suggest someone, someone will think there's an issue, but say we chose a particular subject area, hence the mathematics review. Actually, we know that there's been a significant issue around getting teachers in mathematics, something about the pedagogy in mathematics, the quality of teaching across BG and all the way through to senior phase. So actually, let's take an independent view of that. Let's go in and touch base with across all layers in the system and evaluate and come back with um, findings and also next steps and questions for the system. So that would then go to sure, the political but, no, system. That's, but, it, yeah. but there could be then 32 different local authorities doing 32 different things Never mind 389 secondary schools in Scotland doing 389 different things. My question, I guess, is how do we draw lessons as to what's happening, whether it's in geography or maths or language, the numbers of pupils taking languages falling? I mean, how do we learn? outlined how we draw those lessons. That, that's through the gathering of the work out in local authorities, through inspection, adding to that as well as an independent review, and then collating that into a report which draws those conclusions and asks those questions of the system. Okay, we're not asked nowadays to make any judgment about, as it were, the number of um, young people who pass um, uh, higher exams, because that's a very narrow measure, it is said, of um, the performance of schools and mm -hmm. performance of young people. Mm -hmm. And you made the point in your opening remarks about, and Jenny Cole was asked about this, work experience and various and other pathways and so on and so forth. So if we're not going to just concentrate on that, uh, there's now a range of measurements which are, which are used. Does subject choice actually matter? I think you might want to talk about DYW, Alan. Um, 
The subject choice does matter in that um, we need to make sure that young people are on the right pathway for them, with more and more young people staying on it uh, at school, with many more opportunities um, in their careers, with better careers advice over S123. Young people's expectations are growing. The, the young people in S3 at the moment, moving into their senior phase in August, they started school in August 2009, 10. Um, and the experience and outcomes were published in August, in April 2009. So they have had CFE right the way through. And that growing experience, that growing vision that the teachers have had, and that growing awareness the young people have had about their future life in Scotland, UK, and well, well beyond that, is influencing young people's expectations. So we absolutely have, a, have, an, ex have an expectation and are, uh, a need to make sure that our senior phase provides as much course choice as possible in that variety. And that's why we're seeing, even within the six or a seven um, course choices, as it were, in a school, actually some, some areas, one of the columns, as they call them, where you might choose um, a subject, actually has three or four different short courses in there. So a young person can be taking three or four um, national qualifications by the SQA, full qualifications in the National Five, and lots of short courses to really meet their individual needs and change that over S5 and S6 or study them over one or two years. So entirely flexible approaches. And we're seeing schools, teachers, young people, parents co-creating that kind of experience in there, but constantly changing each year as the different year groups move through the school and have different ideas. OK, so, so your contention, therefore, is that the, that the survey that this committee did, which showed that the majority of schools surveyed, surveyed important, mm -hmm. um, where illustrated that only six subjects were available to fourth year pupils doesn't matter too much. Because in some, in some cases, that six hides the fact that some young people could be taking two or three short courses within one how of how those. How many would that be? Do we know? Sorry? How many would that be? We don't know that exact. Education Scotland doesn't no, but out of 389 that. schools, how many are taking those, how many are offering those four short courses that you've just described? I would think, you know, say, quite, 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 a, quite a number, I would say. We know there's some developing young workforce. I, could, I, I think one of the things that I, I mentioned, I think, in the introduction that you referenced, it was about the, the focus that we have in Scotland on traditional academic subjects. Yeah, sure, absolutely. And actually, our young people are telling us <laughs> They want to be ready for the world of work. And the world of work is very, very changing and very dynamic, as you well know. And so actually we see much more focus on foundation apprenticeships, modern apprenticeships, um, different pathways, great partnerships, and, and probably um, Jenny and Joan could say a little bit more about this, particularly with colleges evolving that particularly I would say in the last two years, there's been an acceleration of that that wasn't there previously. And so when they're given those options or that timetable, often within it there are you know, two, three days a week where there are options that are with FE colleges, mm. either going out to college or children no, are, sure. or the I, lectures I coming here. So there's a yeah. wide range of qualifications. Yeah. So in a way, you know, if, if we only narrow the debate to is it six or five or eight sure. or whatever, yeah. actually we're doing our young people a disservice because actually the offer Absolutely. is very different okay. to even five final, years ago. No, I, I entirely get That's, all that, Gail. I mean, final yeah. question. You mentioned very fairly in your opening remarks that there are teacher shortages and they're not just in rural areas, but this is certainly I'm very acutely aware of, of where they are. Um, how significant now are those in terms of the choice that is being offered in Scotland's secondary schools? Well, it's clearly from our evidence and yeah. from, from the evidence I know of the committee's uh, sample as well that, of course, that is an issue that every school, and particularly those in rural areas, you know, as many of you know, I live in the north particularly, are, are found and have found challenging. Um, it's, it's a challenge and we don't want that to be a reason. A school should design their curriculum to meet their learners' needs and discuss that with the community and, and those around them. And they need to be able to shape that with the best resources that they have. What I would say is, and what is, is really um, encouraging, is that we see real innovation out of some of that hardship. So where um, schools are partnering with um, businesses, with employers, with, to actually make sure they offer, um, Joan may be able to give you an example about computer science, where there is a, a real struggle out there in lots of areas for computer science teachers. Mm -hmm. So actually we're seeing schools actually setting up partnerships with employers to actually bring real life, real life employment opportunities and real life modern techniques into the classroom to help support that learning and offer different qualifications. So yes, there is an issue, we found that ourselves. Um, it's about how we as a system and we support and we share examples where we look at innovative ways to overcome that. And some schools are doing that. It's still the minority, mm -hmm. but we want to share that message mm -hmm. so it becomes the majority. 
Joanne, I don't know if you want to mention some of the work you and Jenny have been looking at. Yeah, I had um, two great examples this week of one secondary school. They were short of um, computing science teachers. So they worked with their local college and in fifth and sixth year, the pupils go to the college for HNC, which is a great qualification for them to end up with. And then in another secondary school, only yesterday in West Lothian, again, shortage in computing. And they'd actually retrained one of their teachers with an interest, but at the same time, they'd created a partnership with a cybersecurity company in the local area that's using drones for the cybersecurity around the businesses there. And they've co-created courses that are very engaging for the young people, upskilling the, 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 the staff in the school, but giving the children these great experiences. So it's a win-win through that co-creation. Uh, but look, we're terrible people because we always want the negatives rather than the positives. So uh, on, since you've chosen computer science, well, <laughs> since you could, <laughs> since you've, oh, bad okay, I'm a terrible person. <laughs> Alistair, on the other hand, is a wonderful person. He'll not ask you any negative questions at all. Um, the, uh, I, I just, since you've chosen computer science, how many computer science vacancies are there in Scottish secondary schools at the moment? I couldn't give you that figure because the, no. the, the, the figures are held by each local authority as the employing authority. So each local authority would be able to give you those figures. Yeah, but you mm. must know. You must have... Isn't it Education Scotland's responsibility to have a good grip of what's going on across education in terms yeah. of... You're not shaking your head, numbers. Mr Armstrong. I think you're saying it's not your responsibility it's to know what's going on. Not, no, not, that's not what not, not, not teacher numbers in each school. The impact of all that and making sure that schools have creative solutions where there's no computing science teacher in there, that... That is very important. Well, so uh, so, 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 so all the schools so, that don't have. Um, teacher, teacher numbers is a responsibility of the Scottish Government. Of course, through our inspection reports, we said we're reporting that, as you clearly <coughs> see, we reported that on Friday, that actually it's having a, a, an impact, and we've reflected that that's the noise that we're hearing across the system. Teacher numbers uh, is a responsibility of the Scottish Government. You might be better asking okay. the Learning Director at College. Right. Thank question. you very much. Yeah. And I want to come back on the computing science. The example that Jenny gave there, the first one, there is a computing science teacher in that school. This is what's fascinating about it. But because it's such a demand for youngsters from various things like cybersecurity, coding, and so on, they freed up the computing science teacher from teaching the traditional subjects and qualifications, and the youngsters now do HNCs, which is a higher level than they were already doing with um, Dundee and Angus College. And um, the teacher is there for free to develop more courses mm. for more youngsters to meet their needs. So that's the kind of creativity Fair we're point. seeing. Fair point. Um, just, just before we move, move on, if I could ask about um, your opening statement, Ms Gorman. Um, you said that the pupils now will have gone their whole um, careers through curriculum for excellent, but then went on to say that there needs to be a mindset change in society about viewing where we are with it, and the debate you wanted to have was around that issue. It's very difficult for us to choose the debates we want to have, because very often they're influenced from outside. And um, for the parents and pupils, they have one chance at this, and the parents, you know, it's, it's, it's one experience. So can you understand concerns when people hear things like schools experimenting, as Mr Armstrong said, work in progress, they need to engage more? Um, what could have been done more to have society and parents on board with this? Because obviously there's deep concern out there about the situation. Who's responsible for having... Um, move that mindset and who's responsible for doing it now? I think that there, there is a, a need, as I said in my opening statement, uh, to share um, what's happening with CFE. Interestingly, as part of the inspection process, we talk to the parents uh, and the community of, of any school during that process. And predominantly across the board, parents are very positive about the experiences their children and young people are having. And so they hear this narrative about, you know, what's wrong. but that's not my school, that's not my child's school. It's, it's the general narrative, there's the odd exception, of course, but it's the general narrative that we get back. I think what has happened with CFE is that we're very guilty, and maybe some of you are reflecting it today in our conversations, about the kind of vocabulary we use in education. You know, the shorthands, the CFEs, the, you know, all these acronyms and different vocabulary we use. Like any profession has its special vocabulary. I don't think that we've been all that good in Scotland about articulating what's happening and what that means out there for parents, for young people. That has become better over time, but actually there was perhaps a missed opportunity at the beginning of CFE to publicly 
talk about the four capacities, for instance. Actually, we all, fundamentally, the world agrees with those four capacities. Educational communities around the world look at the construction of CFE. We have a future and flexible based curriculum. What we need to do is actually be able to talk about that locally be able to explain to a parent of someone in S2 at the moment, actually, these are the different choices and there are these new different and varied qualifications that will lead to this pathway. But that's a societal piece, so I think everyone in the system is a systems change piece. It's a systems change piece where everyone has to shift that mindset. And the more that we talk about a fluid and flexible senior phase and about getting off this ladder of traditional qualifications and having to pass through one gate to get to the next, actually, we have to look at higher education, we have to look at employers, and the messages they send to the system and to parents and young people about five hires in one sitting, about the value of, of that kind of traditional model. So I think there's, there's more to do, and we are ready to develop and to take that forward. And I think the system is now, having gone through quite a bit of confidence building, having had, as, as we said earlier and I've touched on, you know, secondary schools very much engaged in six years worth of changes to qualifications. Actually, the debate now that we're finding in schools is now shifted to the BGE and a very different DYW, uh, developing the young workforce, varied qualification approach. So we need to support, we need to support that narrative nationally. And there is lots of work going on around that and more to do, but so does the whole system. And parents generally, the voice they want to listen to, it's not mine. <laughs> It's the local school. They want to listen and you know, parental engagements about the local school. So I know that there's lots of leadership development and work happening about community links, but more needs to be done. And we picked that up in our inspection about working more closely at an earlier stage with parents in particular in curriculum design across Scotland. Okay, thank you. Can I move to Ms Smith? Thank you, convener. Um, the convener mentioned to Ms Gorman at the start that we have had an extraordinary number of responses to this the vast majority of which are extremely articulate, uh, not using jargon, and making the very strong point that they believe that subject choice has been diminished. Do you agree or disagree with most of these representations? Without having seen the content of them, you know, I, it, it would be ill-placed for me to make a, a, a comment about Sorry, them Sorry, this is the committee papers I'm referring to. Yes, but having not actually had the individual dialogue, I would want to know about the context for each one. Our evidence-based inspection shows that we are recognising that. We are recognising that where there are teacher shortages in particular, there has been a reduction in the curriculum. And that is sporadically around the country, but predominantly around the edges of the country. So we recognise there has been a reduction in some schools in, in curriculum offer, as I said earlier, and in the response to the first question, and that we would like to support schools to look at that innovation and to widen that more can out I, a bit Can I just confirm more. that you have read all the evidence about this? Yes. Because it's not all about teacher numbers, although I that's know it's very, not. I very know. important. Mm -hmm. Do you accept that there are serious concerns about the number of subjects that are being offered uh, in different year groups in different schools and that the general opinion of the evidence that we have received is that that choice has been diminished. Do you accept that? I accept that the general evidence that you, you've be, had submitted absolutely represents that view, yes. Right. If you are accepting that, could you explain why you think that subject choice has been diminished in Scotland? I think one of the major factors has been teacher numbers. But also, some of it has been about curriculum innovation. It's been about choice. It's been about um, uh, thinking about what young people want. So if we take the answer that I gave uh, Mr Scott earlier, in terms of thinking about the wider qualifications, the wider qualifications are taking up more of the curriculum choice. And that should be seen as a positive, because young people are doing HNCs or um, modern apprenticeships or different pathways or wider learning, Duke of Edinburgh, um, Saltire Awards, that whole range. So it's about the definition of qualifications and subject choice. If we actually look at the outcomes of CFE, we're seeing that much more fluid picture and that wider landscape right. of qualifications. Can I, can I just pick you up on two points about this? Mm -hmm. Many of these responses, not all, but many of these responses are pointing to the fact that their um, schools are offering fewer choices in higher and fewer at advanced higher. Mm -hmm. And they're also pointing to the fact that there's no facility to bypass uh, National 5. Now, the, these qualifications matter. They matter a lot 
to the pupils, they matter a lot to parents, of uh, and they obviously matter a lot to colleges and universities. I fully understand and support the fact that there are, is a wider spectrum of qualifications, but do you accept that when it comes to the, uh, what was described by the Scottish Government as the gold standard of qualifications in higher and advanced higher, do you accept that there has been a diminished availability of many of these subjects in many schools? I think what we have to think about here is the qualification, uh, sorry, is the consortia arrangements that local authorities sorry, have. Sorry, I don't understand that. What, what do you mean That's by what that? I'll just explain. So um, in, in many local authorities, and now across a number of local authorities, because of the size of Scottish schools, to, in order to offer the widest range of curriculum choice, there are sometimes what are called in different areas, different things, but consortia arrangements, where you have maybe three schools coming together because they, across them they might have... 15 young people who want to do a particular higher subject or even less than that sometimes at, at advanced higher and so they will timetable collectively so that the young people still get to experience that offer but one of the schools becomes the host school so they have a, a, an, an offer and young people are able to take that subject and they have a shared curriculum offer across three schools or five schools or sometimes in a city, a city campus model, so that they are addressing and making the choice wider for young people rather than narrower. So at an individual school level, the choice in some of those areas may be less, but collectively the offer to young people is wider because it's offered across three schools, for instance, or five or six, however. Well, I, I have to say, Ms Gorman, I don't think we would have had the kind of responses to our committee uh, if that was uh, accepted by most people. Can I, can I just ask about this uh, business of uh, teacher shortages, seeing you seem to think that that's the, the main problem? And, and I fully accept that you're not responsible for the employment of teachers, that, that's absolutely true. But is it not your job to know where these teacher shortages are, specifically in subjects, and to be able to address some of the issues about subject choice, which, uh, as I say, has been very much part of our uh, committee evidence, to know exactly where these problems are. You, you hinted earlier that you didn't think it was your responsibility to know about where the teacher shortages are. No, I think that's, that's a perception and certainly not the, the comments that we were trying to make. Um. No, we, we, we know that we can tell the number of teachers where the issues are in, in two different ways. One, by the report published last week, the thematic, um, where it's a, a deep dive, and also from the range of uh, ongoing inspections. And where um, inspectors in, in a, a secondary school inspection think that there is tension between the availability of um, uh, teachers and the offer that can be made to the young people, and there are no links with other schools, there's no video conferencing or whatever, um, to provide that offer, then they would make that remark um, in, in inspections. Okay. Th that, all of our evidence then, would the Scottish Government are aware, we can make the Scottish Government aware as and when we think there are particular issues, geographically or whatever, and I know that Gail on many occasions have has made exactly those points. So it's passing that information on to um, the, the the government in terms of teacher numbers, subject teacher numbers, etc. Sorry, C could I just finish my remarks, convener? Could I ask, does Education Scotland know how many teachers we are short in each subject, even if it's not your fault that there are these shortages? Does Education Scotland know exactly where the teacher shortages are? Because we don't have an audit of every school in Scotland. There are, um, there is a, a senior phase with a piece of research that the government is now going to um, commission, in fact has commissioned, is just scoping it up at the moment, that will look at the number of subjects in each school, availability um, of subjects, etc. And that's a, a government decision to do that, that trawl across every secondary school in Scotland. So that, that will be coming. We know how many teachers are available nationally. And we know from the teacher census and all kinds of things, but, but same information as you would have and, and the public has. Okay, Mr Mundell. Thank you, um, convener. Um, I guess I uh, just uh, following on to that because I've touched on some of the issues around rural areas. Do you have a view on what the minimum available offer should be in terms of subjects? Is it? Is it I, I, I get the idea that there should be flexibility and you know, schools should be able to decide up to a point, but is, is there a minimum in terms of delivering equity uh, and excellence for all young people in Scotland that you would expect to see in all schools? Can I uh, give a couple of illustrations, practical illustrations, because I don't think we would be in a position of saying that um, there is a minimum number of subjects. If we are still in this debate talking about traditional subjects, and I'm not sure that so, we so, are. So, so there's so, not um, a minimum? No, because not we, are, minimum. We, we, are, we are basing 
our judgments, our help, our support on the school's rationale for what its children need and its youngsters need. So, is, is, okay. is, so, so, so can I just ask then on that point, is it okay then at schools in my constituency that young people aren't able to take the subjects that would enable them to do veterinary studies or medicine? Is, is, is that an acceptable minimum? I'm going to give an illustration from Highland. I remember last time talking to Ms Mandela Dumfries and Galloway. I won't use an example from Dumfries and Galloway today. No, because there's um, not any good examples from Dumfries and Galloway. That's why I'm so angry. That's your view. That's your view. I'm not engaging in that. We engaged in that the last time. Um, in relation to what's going on just now, for instance, in Highland, I just wanted to give an illustration of what is happening as we speak. When I spoke earlier on, and in our submission, we mentioned that there is a naturally evolving process in the senior phase, and part of that has to be about tackling where children want to study subjects that they can't easily access directly in their own school. In Highland, last Friday, um, they are moving towards, and, and I recommend that, that people look at it, what they're calling the Highland Senior Phase Strategy. Now, they're talking about 29 secondary schools plus two or three additional special needs schools which deal with and cater for youngsters in their senior phase of learning. They have the advantage of having three college bases there and also UHI. And they are moving towards a system whereby a child in Wick or a child in Inverness can see what is on offer and can access... So if they want a specialist subject in something, for whatever reason, they can access that in, for instance, digitally or, or in other ways, as, as Gail Gorman said, consortia arrangements. There's a high level of ambition around that, and they've already started that work. So I recommend that, that you look at that well, as an example. So, so, so I've, I've to look at what happens in the Highlands. It's not for Education Scotland... Uh, to, to look at what's happening in Dumfries that's, and Galloway that's what we're doing. and identify that there's a serious problem because consortia arrangements all sound very nice. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and, uh, you know, and we straight away we get on to talking uh, about cities, but I mean, my, my experience is that they don't, consortia arrangements don't work well uh, where schools are so, so far apart. And the reason why schools are small in rural areas is, is because it's not reasonable to ask people to travel that distance yep. uh, and it wastes a huge amount of their time uh, travelling backwards and forwards, they're far away from uh, colleges, the, the other resources are, are not there. So if we um, use that example that illustrates exactly what you've just talked about, so the Western Isles, um, very remote and rural and small and isolated communities and learners. So the innovation there of ESCOL, um, the electronic um, medium that has been used to ensure that that offer that Joan talked about there is particularly strong. It's engaging and ensuring that young people have as wide an offer as possible by having that digital medium. And we have to look at that in education for 21st century learners. And that ESCOL model is now working in eight other local authorities and has also been modelled and used as a model of best practice that authorities such as um, Dumfries and Galloway and other rural authorities are actually looking at and thinking about how that model works for them. And there are individual schools in Dumfries and Galloway who are working very, very hard at this and achieving um, impact and success by making connections locally and across the local authority and out with the local authority, which is the model ESCOL and others is, is enabling Scotland to do. I, I mean, I don't deny individual schools are working very hard. There's lots of excellent teachers, lots of staff busting a gut. But the, I mean, my, my impression is that they and the pupils in these schools don't feel very well supported. Do you think genuinely uh, that uh, e-learning is a, is, a, is a viable alternative yes. and is, yes. is better than having a teacher in the classroom you, know, just, you, you think that's the same experience for pupils? If you look at the um, recent evaluation that was taken out of ESCOL, it has very, very clear um, measures of impact on young people's attainment. And actually, feedback from young people themselves was extremely positive. And it is done in partnership. You know, it's not like... Um, uh, with, you know, a television screen in an empty room and just young people there. It's not done like that. There's a teacher in the room, another, another teacher within the room. There's facilitation, there's usually people support assistance, and it's a very much a collaborative and learning experience. And the evaluation itself shows that young people felt very strongly that it was an effective model. And, and, and do you feel it works equally well in, in all subjects? Yes, I think you have to think about where that would be appropriate. So if actually, you know, you were talking about, say, home economics, right, a practical subject, 
obviously you'd need to think about at what point would that be appropriate because there'd obviously be practical learning experience that children and young people need to engage with and that obviously you, you know you couldn't it's, it's not like a ready steady cook you know <laughs> you wouldn't necessarily be doing it in that way so for some it is absolutely appropriate for others for part of the learning it would be appropriate but it's about that construction of the course so, by the teachers and the educators to make sure the young people get the best out of it so i guess then my question is how does how does that system allow people to to do something like advanced higher chemistry because they, they do advanced higher chemistry because they have some taught sessions that are done through ESCOL or done through um, a collaborative approach. And then they have other sessions that are led and developed as, as they would be as workshops in the school. So, you, so you, still, you still need qualified teachers and people in, present in the school to deliver those subjects? Yes, but it allows the range and the design and the number of young people to be extended, which and is currently not, not the issue. And if all this is available and happening elsewhere, why is it not happening across the country? because it's about system development, it's about schools moving forward on that journey, and it is actually much more widespread than it was a few years ago. It still needs to go further. We, we still want to develop that. Sometimes it's infrastructure, sometimes it's the stage in the, in the development, but equally it's about the learners in the school and the local school making the decision about what best meets their needs. So the, there are still people effectively missing out at the moment because we're on a journey and we're not there yet is that that's your that's that's your perception our evidence has shown us that actually there is great strides being made in system change and system movement yep. particularly in the last two years what, what we're seeing more and more Ms. Mandela, actually is um yes some school innovation but actually a much richer um discussion with local authorities and between local authorities and local authorities actually getting a grip of this now and looking very carefully at what, what's available and making sure that in situations you're, you're suggesting they have advanced higher chemistry, that there is a block of time with the um, a local college to do some real practical work with the equipment that's required, etc., and top it up. So they are looking creatively. Thank you, Ms. Mandela. Quick supplementary, Mr. Yeah. Uh, actual Allen. point here. I mean, East Gaul, which is a great thing, was described as being in the Western Isles, is headquartered in the Western Isles, but perhaps this is relevant to Mr. Mandela's question. It is available and used by other local authorities, so it's it's not a Western Isles thing. So it, so it, it is open to another local authority should they need it yes. to, to go in. I mean, my, my question, I suppose, would be um, absolutely accepting what Mr. Mandel is saying about the need for for human interaction. You know, if you are in a school in Argyll or Uist or somewhere where the option is to have a class in advanced hire with one person. Surely having some kind of e-school or something like it is actually widening subject choice rather than narrowing it. And that's a way that that's that's the tension we're sitting in just now. That the schools who have, I'm thinking of several who have doubled what's on on offer in terms of and and. I'm wary of using the word subject if, if, if we're still all talking about traditional subjects, in other words, what I learned at school. Um, so there, the range of options typically um, is expanding and youngsters are making more informed and precise choices. Now, we cannot look at that in a one-to-one -one correlation of an adult being there for whatever that subject or topic is. You know, we, we, we have to get some flexibility in it, and that's where the digital offer and why what eSchool in particular is offering is exciting because it's also looking at pedagogy. It's looking at how do you teach an advanced hire in physics or, or whatever to a group of two children, some of whom might be sitting in Dumfries and Galloway or might another two in Aberdeen. So, so that's what's um, exciting about that just now. And youngsters responding really well to that, and why wouldn't they? Uh, another quick supplementary, Ms. Lamont. I mean, I understand exactly in, in remote communities where there are very few young people as creative as possible in order to allow them access to subjects. But I wonder if an equality impact assessment has been done in a policy in terms of which schools in a city like Glasgow would be in circumstances where they'd be expected to make consortium arrangements as opposed to those who would have access to it within their school. Um, I'm sure the local authority, if they went to consortia arrangements... But, you, um, but with respect, you're saying consortium arrangements are a good thing. Yes. What a city quality impact assessment have you made of where those consortiums will necessarily be organised as opposed mm. to places where they won't be organised? If I give you an example, when I, I, um, in some parts of Glasgow, you won't be able to do five hires. So you would have to, if you want to do five hires, or you want to aspire to do a, su a subject university or further education that require that group of subjects, you will have to be involved in a consortium arrangement of some sort. 
Another school half a mile away, where you're already, you could argue, be advantaged, you will not have to go anywhere to do those five subjects. You can do them all within your school. And what I'm asking you is whether you've done an equality impact assessment on a consortium proposal, which you've already said is a good thing. We wouldn't have done an equality impact assessment because it would have been for the local authority when well, they're designing can I ask those you offers. Why they you would wouldn't do, that. do an equality impact assessment on a proposal which you are commending to us when it may in fact reveal that some young people would be obliged to go into consortium arrangement when other young people won't, and that it's therefore an issue about your already disadvantaged education system and you are advocating a system which will increase that disadvantage. Surely, as an agency, you'd be expected to look at what the impact of the proposal that you're commending would be on youngsters who are already disadvantaged. That wouldn't be our understanding, because our reflections are that we already have inspected numerous schools who are part of consortia, because consortia are not a new innovation. No, In some areas that. of the country, they've been around for you know, know, 10 make, years, but maybe. My, my, with respect, so with that's respect, the focus that we're I'm having. I'm asking you to address the question. And I'm, I, I've, I think I've clearly addressed that we would not be doing in that. In an individual school, they have a consortium arrangement. It is necessary for them to offer young people a bridge mm -hmm. of subjects. Mm -hmm. I'm asking you whether you have looked at the, whether there is an equality impact on some young people but it looks as if they're having access to the same education as a young person up the road. But in fact, they're not, because they're having to travel to, to do one hire and then come back, so they're losing, mm. losing time. It, I mean, it may be that it's a necessary proposal. I'm asking you whether you have looked at whether it is a, it is a proposal. I mean, you, you look at individual schools, but do you ever compare one school with another? So the, the learner journey so for a youngster in one school will be different from the learner journey for a child mm -hmm. in another school, and the consortium proposal may reinforce that. If you're commending that as an option, mm -hmm. when in fact what it may mean is it's increasing disadvantage to young people, is that not something that's your responsibility? The responsibility for the curriculum delivery lies at the school level, and if they have changed their curriculum offer, if they have designed something that meets the needs of their learners and they can justify that, and that they are able with their community and with the support of their pupils and learners to see that impact positively, then that would be for them to do. Our role is when we inspect schools, one of our co uh, quality indicators is actually looking at equity. And so if we were to pick up through that, that there was a significant impact on any particular learner group for any particular reason, that would be reported it's back. it's not within the school, I'm not talking about within the school. But within the school offer, the curriculum consortia offer, if we inspect a secondary school, we look at the curriculum as a whole. If children are going to two so, other secondary schools, that would be taken into and evaluated. And so therefore, we would be able to pick that up there. So we have a system where we would pick then? that up. But what would you then do? We would then report it. There would be, if it was an issue, it would then be one of the areas for development. There would probably be an action for a follow through inspection and there would be a conversation with the local authority. We have clear processes so if there was said, a concern you've already commended, through inspection. With respect, you've already commended consortium arrangements. You're now saying that at no point has it occurred to the edu Education Scotland to assess whether, in fact, there's an equality issue here. between That's the not school. what I'm saying. That's well, your interpretation of what I'm saying. Right, so That's not what I'm saying. So you have looked at that then? And well, you're in, you, I've, you, I've tried have, to, to say several times that what we... What we would do is the local authority, if they are changing their curriculum offers, current common practice would be the local authority would take that through their education committee or their equivalent, and they would do an equality impact assessment. That's the duty of, of where local authority responsibility for education sits. We would, in our role, through inspection, as we would with any inspection, we would be looking at the quality of education that's provided for those young people not just within the walls of the institution, within the quality of education experiences that they have. And we would report through our normal processes on that. That hasn't changed, and that is clearly our role and our duty to do that. Thank you. Um, can I bring Mr. Greer in? Uh, convener, I want to stick with this point about consortiums. Ms. Gorman, do you accept that while they might reduce the problem, 
they are simply uh, displacing it because a pupil who has to travel to another school to take up a subject is either going to miss the opportunity, for example, extracurricular activities at lunchtime or after school, or they miss part of or all of the period on either side of the one where they have gone to another school to study. So it might reduce the problem because it has given them the opportunity to study that subject. It has caused them to miss out on other opportunities, though. Where, where, where we find um, local authorities who are um, looking very closely at this consorting arrangement, they're taking these kind of matters in, into account. The evidence we have from young people, um, and I've spoken to many um, young people who are involved in these, the, the motivation that they receive from going to that different institute, that different school or whatever, and being involved in the activities in that other school um, can, can more than compensate. Um, uh, so hold, hold on, Mr. Armstrong. You're saying that the motivation from going to another school to get a subject uh, that, if they had simply uh, been a pupil at that other school, they would have had availability of in the first place, that the motivation compensates for the fact that they will have missed out on the opportunity to take part in either an extracurricular activity, a band, a football team, no. whatever, at lunchtime, or the opportunity to fill a period in their timetable with other studies. No, I, I can see it happening in two different ways. I can see them um, still being able to, to um, attend various activities in their own school, in the times that they're not in, in a different school, or I can also no, see, them, I, no, I can see them joining Mr. Armstrong, in, just, in a different school. I would suggest that you please do not again uh, suggest that the motivation uh, that they get from it getting the subject to another school compensates for this. If the school football team in their year group practices on a Thursday lunchtime, but they have to travel on a Thursday lunchtime to another yeah. school to get their subject, they cannot participate in that school football team. That would be true with any other extracurricular activity. It would be true with anything that they're missing out of in the timetable. Can you not just concede that having to travel to another school to take up a subject reduces their opportunity to do something else. I accept it is fantastic they get the opportunity to take up that subject, but can you not see that other opportunities are lost? Surely that is just a statement of fact. There, there, there may be um, opportunities that are lost. If, if we are visiting a school or inspecting a school and that kind of issue comes through the, the um, questionnaires from young people that they are missing out, or I have certainly come through discussions um, with inspectors in there, um, or this in, it, it, discussions I've had, it hasn't come up, but may have come up in other schools in there, then that would be noted in there as actually back to this equality impact that young people are missing out on Duke of Edinburgh because it's on in a Thursday afternoon and they're at the college. And what is the school doing about it? Absolutely. If, it, if it's a fundamental issue in there, we would expect the school to, to, to address it and actually to be aware of it when they're, des when they're designing it. And that's part of, um, again, some of the work that we're moving into that, that Joan may wish to discuss with some other local authorities, where they're actually looking at the whole um, offer if like across a local authority as, uh, as more of a kind of local authority or regional type of offer to make sure that anything like this where a young person may feel they're being missed out is, is catered for. So if it's an issue at the moment, and I haven't come across it, but if it is an issue and we pick it up, then we would certainly flag it. But when we're working now in, in future and we're beginning to build up um, uh, more work in schools, as, as Gail noted at the start, we would certainly be aware of, of, of those issues. Right. Uh, to move to the, the wider point, what, uh, what work has Education Scotland done to evaluate the impact of deprivation on subject choice and availability? You do. I can. Yep. Yep. Um, every inspection that we look at looks at the, um, the, the curriculum, the curriculum offer, the uptake in the curriculum and the achievement of young people in the context of that school. Um, where they feel that the learning pathways of young people are not being met, either because the, um, the curriculum offer in that school is, is not right, it's, some people's needs just are, are not reflected, or indeed there are not the links with other schools to provide it or links through anything else, then that, that, that would be noted. Really right. noted. Uh, so I get how the overall inspection yeah. programme works, and I get how you would identify yes. those issues within an individual school. Yes. But I, I think I'll, I'll be able to answer your, 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 your initial I question. So, so um, the Scottish Attainment Challenge, um, we uh, have attainment advisors in all 32 local authorities who are working directly with individual schools. 
um, and uh, working with them on their plans. And so as part of the Scottish Attainment Challenge work, we report regularly. Um, it used to be quarterly, it's now biannual. Um, uh, on the detail of every local authority and the schools and what they're doing to close the equity gap and looking at the offer, the approach, their use of a variety of, of approaches, local authority, people equity fund and others. And so um, we are looking and directly reporting on that on a, on a regular basis. So can you tell me now what impact does deprivation have on subject choice in our schools? Our evidence is showing that the deprivation factor hasn't been as significant as perhaps we would have went in with an initial hypothesis. Okay? That actually it's about it's about the range and quality, and often um, in relation particularly to SAC local authorities, so Scottish Attainment Challenge authorities, and funded schools, because of the additional resource they have, they have been able to continue to offer and actually quite innovatively in many cases offer quite a wide range of uh, a curriculum offer and its variety and experiences within it, very rounded and and. Uh, strong offer on the basis of that. Actually, what, what we're finding is that sometimes it's actually um, areas where they're, you know, they're not challenge authorities or they're not um, receiving significant funding for Pupil Equity Fund, that sometimes that's more of a factor in terms of, of the curriculum offer and, and what they're able to do. But geography and demographics still always play a part. So sometimes just the ability to re recruit teachers as we started this discussion on. So the Times newspaper, their education correspondent, did some work on this and found that uh, in areas where a school will have more than three quarters of its pupils living in an area of deprivation, the average offer at higher levels is 17 subjects. In an area where less than one in four of the children at the school are living in an area of deprivation, the average offer at higher is 23 subjects. What's your response to that? That, I think we'd need to delve down into that more deeply, school by school. The point is, how, they, a, how, they, how they appropriate no, is Mr. the offer? Mr. Armstrong, hold on. They put those numbers out 18 months ago, so yeah. you've had but 18 months to delve how, into that. Yeah. How, how appropriate is the offer um, in each school to the young people that are there at any time? What's the full range on, on offer in there? I mean, the hires, yes, the, the, there are, uh, there's a large catalogue of SQA hires, but there are many, many more courses at the same level as higher, either short courses, qualifications, awards, that young people can build up. So rather than just look at it through that one lens, you actually have to look very carefully at the entire offer. And that's part of the research that um, the government are beginning to, to, to commission, is to look much more deeply, not just at what might be seen as one awarding body or indeed one group of subjects, but actually what's the entirety of the offer being available. I mean, we, we know in the last um, few years that the number of skills-based qualifications, courses, awards, has more than doubled in Scotland, up to 50,000 um, last year. Now, many schools in all kinds of areas are, are offering those kind of courses. But again, what we'd be interested in is getting underneath those st statistics um, and looking much more broadly at the young people and whether the, 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 the short courses, full courses they're on, matches what they require. And that can change every year. Does Education Scotland accept that if I were a pupil uh, choosing hires at one of, uh, in a school in Scotland in one of its most deprived communities, that I would have, on average, six less hires offered to me than an equivalent pupil at a, uh, in an area that is certainly not deprived? No, that's not. We, we wouldn't accept that. That's the fact that that article was based on and that research was based on. Our experience and our evidence is showing us that there are other factors and that to use that one indicator um, would be unfair to the, the systems but, but, but that, that, that one indicator is very relevant if I want the hires that I need to get into university of course. And I accept absolutely the points you made about uh, the expansion of non-traditional subjects, the expansion of other qualifications, other opportunities like apprenticeships. But if we are to get more working class Scottish pupils into university, they need hires. But the school they go to, the area they live in, how deprived it is, clearly has a significant impact on the number of hires that are available to them. Does Education Scotland accept that? That's not our experience. But I'm, I'm our telling you that that is the reality. I can only tell you what reality. our evidence tells you. Our evidence is not indicating that. So Education Scotland have looked into the higher availability in our schools based on the level of deprivation in the area and have found that there are no significant differences between our most and least deprived communities. You are asking, if, as, as, as a nation, as, as, are we seeing that differential? I think I clearly said that looking through our evidence reports around the Scottish Attainment Challenge, where our most deprived schools are clustered, that that is not the evidence that we are currently seeing. We are seeing sporadic um, 
pockets of, of choices, but are based on a variety of factors which we've already articulated um, through, our, through our earlier I answers. I think the committee would benefit from you supplying the evidence that contradicts what the Times is telling us, because there seems to be based on a pretty simple set of FOI requests from 32 councils. So I think we would find it the very Scottish beneficial. attainment challenge reports are in the public domain. I don't think the Scottish Attainment Challenge reports contradict what I'm telling you about the uh, availability of higher subject choice, but I don't think we're going to get any further forward with this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I bring in Mr Gray? So we've um, been talking quite a lot about bread to choice, uh, and I wanted to come back to um, ask a couple of questions about outcomes and attainment. Um, uh, and ask for clarification in a couple of paragraphs in uh, your written evidence. Um, so in paragraph four of the written evidence, it says, uh, it's talking about the changes to senior phase, and it says that may well mean young people taking fewer qualifications. And then it goes on to say, we should be comfortable with these changes as it enables schools and partners to prepare young people with 21st century learning knowledge and skills. Now that reflects some of the evidence you have, you've given Gail today. Can I be very clear then that what this is saying is that young people doing fewer qualifications is not an unintended consequence of curricular change. It is an objective of that curricular change. Yes, it is. Okay. It's part of it. It's Good. part of the design within the senior phase that um, young people experience um, not just qualifications, but a whole range of, of, of leadership, um, uh, volunteering, wider, wider experience so, that helps them for their lives. Good, but pupils coming out with fewer exam passes is a deliberate outcome of the curriculum. It's, we are measuring attainment differently. We're measuring the young people's atta attainment achievement on the point of exit from the senior phase when they're 18 years old, wherever that learning has taken place with an 18-year-old nowadays. We're not looking at the figures year on year so much as what is it young people are exiting with. And those statistics are going up, both in terms of the, the qualifications that, that, that they have and of the standard. I think, um, to help with that, the build, the, back in the day, the build on the curriculum three, um, uh, guidance that came out to school some time ago kind of clearly articulates that and talks about a changed and a, a different set of qualifications and about an exit point rather than you know measuring at S4. So you know that certainly was part of the architecture of the of the design of CFE was to get that variety and range to reflect individual needs. Well, okay, but that's not happening, is it? Because the evidence to the committee showed that for those who exit with national level qualifications. They are coming out with fewer qualifications. And indeed, if you look at the percentage of young people who leave school with no formal qualifications, in the last two years, that percentage has increased year on year. It's a small number, but it, it's going in the wrong direction. So, uh, but again, uh, behind the, those statistics um, are the range of courses that young people um, are taking, short courses, long courses, not all of which may appear in, in statistics. In the, in the current set of statistics. No, but, but, but I'm sorry, Mr Armstrong, but a moment ago you said young people were coming out with more qualifications. They are. That, that's not true for that cohort of young people who leave with national qualifications rather than higher. The, 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 yes, but the, the, it's, it's the range of qualifications that, that they have that... Um, it's the, short, if, if you like, the latest those and short, best qualifications. Those, those short courses are... Not recognised qualifications. They are recognised, but, but they, 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 they could yeah. be very bespoke qualifications for certain young people yeah. for whom um, a National 4, National 5, and National 3 are not appropriate. There could so, be skills-based courses, there could be community-based kind of courses. You, you, you're talking yeah. about. There could be saltire awards, they, they could be working in the, in the community awards um, for p young people with very particular re requirements. Okay. One of, one of the other um, things which the evidence the committee has received would appear to indicate is that the changes we're talking about have led to uh, a number of subjects being squeezed out of the curriculum, languages in particular, computer science, which was spoken about uh, as well today. Uh, it's difficult, perhaps you could explain how a change which has that effect is going to prepare uh, young people with 21st century learning knowledge and skills for modern life. Yeah. Yes, there, it, it, in two different ways. One is that um, the, 
the senior phase was per the, sorry the broad general education was purposely designed as providing a much um, higher um, platform of learning and a platform of expectations of learning by the age of, of S3. It was designed as what you might call the educated young Scot in there. So the experiences and outcomes that young people are entitled to, to um, experience right up to the age of 15 um, take them to a higher level than would have been um, the case under the, under the previous system in there. And, if you, and where um, that over the S4 to S6, many schools are looking that, like that, that as one group of young people. So that for areas like modern languages or others, you know, young people in fourth year can be working with young people in, in fifth year. But there's also um, within so, modern so, languages. So, sorry, just for my own understanding, mm -hmm. are you saying that it doesn't matter that languages are squeezed out of the senior phase because the level of achievement in language in S1, 2 and 3 is now greater than the, the, it ever was. In two ways, there's, there's a stronger um, experience of modern languages up to S3, but also languages start in primary one now as well, under the, the government's one plus two languages initiative. And then another language comes so, in so at, I'm sorry, at, you're at saying five. It doesn't matter that young people can't study languages because they've been squeezed out of the senior phase curriculum because mm. they've yeah, not, not all young people school. studied a language at one time anyway, but nowadays they do start off at the end of S3 with a much stronger understanding. But again, there are a mixed range of course options over S4, 5, 6. So a young person may not study in S4, but can pick it up in S5 or S6. <laughs> or indeed, there are many short courses available for young people to pick up language learning or other um, subject learning over their S4, S5, S6. OK, I'm conscious of time, and I did want to ask about another paragraph in the evidence. And this is paragraph nine. Paragraph nine is about promoting young people's mental well-being. And it says that it talks about an increase in stress and mental health issues for young people. And then it says, there is no doubt that large numbers of examinations and year-on-year -year examinations over S4 to S6 are a cause for stress in many young people. So can I ask, is this paragraph saying that uh, a reduction in the number of subjects that people study <coughs> towards formal examinations is in part being delivered in order to reduce stress and improve mental health. Is that, is that the purpose of that change? Um, I think the, the issue is we have a, 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 I have quite a lot of engagement with a, a learner panel um, that's newly set up and talking to young people and we've been doing some work with Young Scott and others across the year of young people. And actually the, the persistent narrative that the young people, and I'm sure uh, those given evidence to you may, may also articulate this, is that um, they are um, coming under huge pressure that they put on themselves, some of it, and some of it societal pressure, um, and anxiety around a whole host of things. But in particular, they're they are quite anxious, quite rightly, about their own success, about examinations, about the workload across particularly, you know, key year groups. So one of the things that, you know, CFE should be delivering in its, in its senior phase is a phasing of that, is, is actually thinking, if we get away from that ladder and a gate, you know, from National 5 to higher to advanced higher, and actually you've got a young person who's really gifted in a particular area, or just as a strength in mathematics, actually they, they don't necessarily need to do the National 5. They could go in at higher, and they could do that and take, you know, not have that subject at S4, or equally, you know, take out a few, so they're only doing, you know, four subjects and then pick up another two the next year or another two, etc. And it's about that fluid and flexibility and the ability to, for schools to identify that and to help to take out some of the additional stressors there are in the system when young people and teenagers are, are actually coming through quite a lot of changes anyway. So schools are working in, and working really closely with their, their own learner panels in schools to think about what they can do to reduce that and how we as a system can make sure we don't add further pressure to, to young people's mental health. We want them to have health and well-being. This sentence says there is no doubt that large numbers of examinations and year-on-year -year examinations over S4 test 6 are a cause for stress in many young people. And I just wonder, apart from the dialogue you've had with learner panels, what the evidence is for that sentence? That has mainly been the evidence from those discussions, from the individual pupil um, discussions that happened during inspections, and from the experience of um, things such as events that we all attend around the Year of Young People, around um, school celebration event, where young people 
will often engage with the, the wider team and talk to us, as well as the teacher panel. The teacher panel articulate that one of the major priorities, as do unions um, focus in and, and repeat that this has come from their evidence, that actually the mental health and wellbeing of young people has been affected and is affected by the stress so that comes through an examination okay. diet, sometimes quite tightly channeled. So there's no channeled. clinical evidence around mental health to not support in, that? Not in the way we've articulated there, no. Thank you. Uh, in Brigham, Ms. Mackay. Yes, thank you, Karina. Yeah, really, just I mean to follow on from um, Ian Gray's line of, of questioning, just briefly, um, was the, the fall in the take up of languages anticipated when the senior phase was designed? The a comment here on the, on the fall in languages. My understanding is that there has been a fall in languages generally across the UK. I mean, and that's that's the trend. And some well, of that, just, some just of that, just concerned with Scotland. Yes, I know, yeah. I know. But some of that is due. This is the point I'm trying to make to young people's own choices. You know, there is a, you know, and and that's kind of at the heart of this. And you know, I can say that today as a as a parent trying to convince young people to do that. Young people have a, an attitude to language now that partly it's because they've done sometimes French for a long time and the view is I've done enough of that now, I know enough of that and it's not a choice for qualification. That plays into it hugely. Um, now I haven't got any statistical evidence to prove that to you but that's the conversation that goes on from young and people. And does that concern Education Scotland? I think any, I think <laughs> any loss of any option is a concern, you know, so I think we want to keep all of that in play. Mm -hmm. And can I also ask how it interacts with the STEM strategy? Because there clearly are problems there and, and how the design of the senior phase, um, is it compatible? What, what do you see as the problems with, with, with the, the STEM, STEM strategy? strategy. Uh -huh. What do you see with the, the problems? Well, clearly we're, we're encouraging people, you know, that the, the, there is a wider issue around STEM and obviously there's a huge push to get more people into that. Do you think the senior phase encourages people? Yeah, um, yeah, encourages people into STEM or, or, or yes, conflicts yes, with languages. Yes. Yeah, it encourages uh -huh. people into STEM. Well, if I can come back to um, the kind of comment I made earlier on that STEM, by its very nature, just the fact that you have these three or four subjects which coalesce around making up STEM and what STEM is, um, is providing a lot of um, uh, impetus in the system just now, all the debate and the conversation of what's already taken place and the kind of um, very short year that we've had since the strategy was launched, um, brings together that focus on what's going on in BGE right through from primary onwards around um, interdisciplinary learning or project-based learning, so getting um, people to uh, see STEM, the, the science is working together with maths and so on. So. I think what we're seeing is that STEM, the strategy and the work that's going on, has, has provided an energy in the system, which comes back to what I said earlier on about the requests for further help with BGE and the planning and designing of that. So I think at the moment, um, we're looking at that as a very positive um, but is it translating forward. into the senior phase? You know, is, is, it, is it active in the senior phase? Yeah, yes. What we're seeing um, is the uptake, actually, um, of such a much wider range of opportunities in, in STEM, particularly in, in the sciences. So rather than perhaps, you know, look at um, uh, higher physics, higher chemistry, national five physics or chemistry, young people, there's options there around about um, fish industries. So the application of science in different, in, in different areas is allowing those pathways to, to, to grow quite a bit. So we're seeing different kind of STEM opportunities opening up in there. We've mentioned already cyber security being an area that young people um, find very interesting and they can see the, the, the potential in, in, in work from that. So we're seeing it manifesting itself in the, in the breadth of choice that, that schools are beginning to offer. I think it'll be just a, an example that comes to mind because we were working with the school, Grove Academy in Dundee, um, has for, I think, two years, it's into its third year, it had offered advanced higher advanced higher engineering science, I think that's what it's called, engineering science. And it, two or three years ago in consultation with parents and the youngsters, kind of um, their view was that the advanced higher wasn't giving the youngsters what they were wanting or what they were needing because of conversations they were having with employers and universities. And they've created an interdisciplinary approach, a project-based learning approach where youngsters do in their sixth year um, a, an engineering project. And the results of that um, are well, it's something we want to share more widely with other schools, but they've been pretty um, impactful for young people. Um, and, and the feedback from that is something that we're going to explore and develop a bit further. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
Thanks very much. Um, I want to say in the outset that um, probably the panel know that I'm supportive of CFE and the flexibility that goes along with it. They probably also anticipate I'm going to ask about languages and then uh, focus in on Gaelic. However, on the former, just looking at languages in general, can it possibly be a good thing for Scotland that languages in the, the number of formal qualifications in languages uh, declined by 18 per cent in fourth year between uh, 2014 and 2018? The concern is, I think, as, as Joan articulated, we want our young people to be global citizens and we want them to be able to communicate in order to do that. Um, I think that is something that, uh, post the SQA examination diet and the results that we've been looking at in terms of, of Education Scotland and working with our, our partners across the sector and developing language learning, but also that is, you know, the statistic you quoted there is the S4 drop and I think we just need to reflect that there will be young people who pick that up particularly in S5 given the comments so is, there evidence for said that? is there evidence that, that uh, a significant number of people are doing what you just said and picking up languages in S5 given what you said about the fact that people in many cases think they've had enough of languages in third year <laughs> I don't have the evidence for that. I know that that's the conversations that young people have. You know, that they, they will drop it now and they will pick it up later. So I think it's an interesting thing to find out if they do pick it up later because there's a perception uh, that there are certain qualifications that they can pick up later and crash or, you know, higher, do them in higher stages. I don't have the data to, 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 to support it. One of the, of the critical offer in, in senior phase, I think, that, that we need to be looking at more is to what are the options. If young, per if young people um, don't wish to do a full qualification, what are the short courses that prepare them for what they might be doing and thinking about doing in the next stage of their learner journey up to 24 through the whole learner journey approach? So um, are schools aware enough, are teachers aware enough, are teachers ready to offer um, a, a much better variety of opportunities for young people in the senior phase? I suppose that, that leads into another question. I mean, you, you, you've said there about when it comes to languages that one of the driving forces in this is that um, is, is choice, is, is the choice that young people themselves are making. And how, again, to come back to this point that some young people in third year feel that they've learned enough about certain things. I mean, I, as a grumpy 14-year-old, felt I had done quite enough of several subjects at school, thanks very much. Um, probably all of them, yeah, apart from Latin. <laughs> Apart from Latin, and <laughs> I was uh, the school kind of saved me from myself by by Absolutely. making sure that I did exactly. take a variety of subjects yeah. in third and fourth year. Indeed. Now, I'm just slightly concerned as to whether whether the whether we're I'm looking for the Gaelic here for for laissez faire. I think it's coma Are we are we completely are we completely laissez faire here about what people are doing in third and fourth year? Um, because, I, as I say, I, I support what CFE is doing. I support this flexibility. I understand that when it comes to languages, there are languages for life, I think they're called, and all manner of other courses. But are we completely agnostic about the fact that there's been almost a 20% drop in formal qualifications in fourth year in languages? No, I don't think we are agnostic about that. Um, and I think we, we're seeing here that we need to do a bit more work to understand why it is that youngsters are choosing um, to drop languages in, in, you know, for, for other things. Um, and I, think, I don't think that's down to the number of column choices. I think it's, it's much wider than that. I think it's much wider than that. Um, because I think that the, certainly what we're picking up in all of our conversations with youngsters, far more questioning about the purpose of learning, why are they doing something? And there is that belief that they can pick it up from wherever, the internet or whatever, which, which you know, I suppose we all had in varying degrees. But in the, in the broad general education, um, children are still being asked to study a language right up until the end of third year. Um, so that, that would still be the normal ask. It's then at the point, it's at that point, why do they choose not to take a qualification in it? And I think that's probably bears more um, uh, examination and question around what's going on there. Um, I mean, we do know of individual departments who are far more active in making the language, whatever it is, French, Spanish, applicable, purposeful, um, I don't want to quote any schools just now because I'm not secure enough of, of, of the facts and I wouldn't want to land them in it. But, um, you know, schools who have been very more um, hands-on, applying the learning, applying the language in real situations. Um, 
and that's more attractive, I think, to young people. So. Okay, and uh, on, on Gaelic specifically, in that case, uh, the decline for the number of people taking uh, either fluent or learner Gaelic uh, National 5 uh, has been much more extreme. I don't have the figure in front of me, but uh, it's, it's much more extreme than the figure I quoted for languages, probably between twice and three times as extreme. Um, this is surely at odds, is it not, with the increase in the number of people going through primary school entirely in the medium of Gaelic, the increase of interest in Gaelic. The, what, have you done any kind of study into what unusual factors can possibly drive such an extreme drop in the number of people doing these two subjects uh, in Gaelic? Is everybody looking at me? Because yes. I, yeah, I'm not looking yeah, at you. I, <laughs> <laughs> I like the way they all look at me. Um, I, th I think. I think we've always known there's been a struggle to get, you know, there's an increasing number of youngsters now coming through GME, and that's great to see. But equally, there's the issue of, do we get enough subject teachers, and is there a wide enough variety of subjects in Gaelic medium uh, at the other end? And that's that's an ongoing issue, you know, about where you get the staffing to support. I'm, I'm not talking about staffing. No. I'm talking about schools which have Gaelic teachers, where there has been a decline in the number of children, take, young people taking uh -huh. Gaelic. Well, I'm probably not close enough to it, uh, Mr. Allen, to give an answer to that. Um, I'll check my notes, but I don't think I can give you a direct answer to that at the moment. OK, in that case, um, can I ask about, um, again, related to Gaelic, um, regional improvement collaborative, since this was mentioned earlier on in another context. Um, Education Scotland is making appointments to these. Um, in doing so, given its Gaelic strategy and so on, does it, does it fully recognise the distinction between uh, Gaelic as a subject, as we've just talked about just now, and Gaelic medium education? And is part of its strategy trying to overcome this situation, which seems to have arisen with, with Gaelic's place or Gaelic as a subject's place in the curriculum in secondary? Yeah, yes, I mean, the, I think a colleague, the colleague who has been assigned um, to one of the regional collaboratives is very much working on the basis of the density of schools who are offering Gaelic. So that decision has been based on where the need is greatest. Um, so we should see some impact from that. Thank you, Kindina. Thank you. Um, I'm looking for a one-word answer, hopefully, um, <laughs> or as close to as we can get. From what you've said about broad general education and up to third year, does that mean that you're content that schools aren't still following a two plus two plus two model of curriculum for excellence? Almost a word, one word answer. Yes, in the context of shaping the curriculum to meet the needs of the community and, and young people. That, as we said earlier, a variety of approaches to um, the delivery of the curriculum and that journey, and people are in different places around it. So there are still schools doing two plus two plus two in certain areas. It's not that easy to explain. The point is that it is three plus three. Qualifications do not start until S4, S4 to S6. But as we explained earlier, I think in, in response to, to Ms. Gilruth there, um, the learning for some qualifications starts in the primary school, and the same as your learning for your driving test can start when you're young and you're learning about observations on the road and what traffic lights mean, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there could be situations where pupils are stopping languages far earlier than third year? They should be achieved. Their, their entitlement is to um, experience all of the experiences and outcomes up to the third curriculum level over S1 to S, if, sorry, over primary to S3. Um, a quick supplementary, Mr. Patterson. Yes, in regards to the differential uh, in terms of attainment, in my constituency, it's two separate, uh, two different uh, councils. In one area, it's a challenged area, one is a well-off area. And the difference in choices is quite stark. So, a kind of chicken and egg question. And you were saying about it's the, uh, the pupil's choice. So, if there's no teachers available, then how does that work? So, is it because there's a lack of particular teachers in a given area? And how is it driven? Is it driven by the school or by the local authority? Because in my constituency, it's quite stark, the differential between the two. L local authorities employ the teachers and the, and, and the range of teachers. So, so the cause of choice is because of lack of teachers, in your view, and, and specialist we, teachers? Or? Kind of, it's variable. Um, that is particularly a factor in more rural areas. 
but it's also a factor in other areas, as I'm sure you've heard from the individual evidence that's there. Um, sometimes it's about subjects. So, you know, we've, we've mentioned computer science. I don't want there are actually could be really great computer science teachers yeah. out there as well. But you know, there are certain areas at certain type where you know the throw the flu throw. What's the word I'm looking for? The flow through of um, teachers from initial teacher training into the system is very very limited in, in some subject areas in Scotland. So sometimes it's that. Sometimes it's geographical. Um, a whole range of factors. But again, if you look at the numbers and if you compare my area, it's very similar to Glasgow and the situation there. And I don't think it's a coincidence in any way that where you have an area that's challenged, deprived, and an area that's affluent, there is a differential. So there's, there's something happening there. And it's that something that I think we should be looking at very carefully. And it seemed, seems to me it's a lack of specialist teachers. Uh, or teachers in particular subjects that causes this to kick in in the first or, place. Or, the, or the, the, the requirements and the wishes of the young people um, for the range of options that they wish to, to, to pursue in their senior phase. And well, one, one follows yeah. the other. That, that's really what, what we're looking at. Yeah, that's, the, that's the chicken and egg question yes. I'm, I'm trying to raise. So yeah. if there's no teacher there, then it, it ends. and <laughs> It doesn't get started. If there's no teacher there, so to me, although as I said, teach, uh, schools are looking at much more creative ways to make sure that the young people, right away from S1 to S3, do experience mm. all of the the curriculum areas that they should, and that that would be our expectation in every inspection that young people do experience or the full entitlement up to the end of S3. They have that offer. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Miss Lamont. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, obviously, Education Scotland has a role in inspecting but also has a role in informing and shaping education policy. Um, and I would hope has a role in terms of understanding how inequality can be reinforced by the education system. Um, and really the suggestion that inequality comes because young people choose it, I think is probably a, a bit of misrepresentation of what happens. Can I ask you specifically around an issue that's been certainly flagged up anecdotally to me, but also in evidence, is the number of subjects that are taught in by and tri-level classes. Do you have an analysis of where those by and tri-level classes are in the system? Again, no, we, we couldn't have classroom by classroom information right, so at that kind of you level. You wouldn't know whether disproportionately young people have an access to a subject at a number of levels, you wouldn't know whether in some schools or in some areas or in some communities, you're more likely, for example, to be taught higher physics in a tri-level class than in other communities. No, we wouldn't have a national overview of that, no. What, what, what we do, we, if we see it, and we do see that um, in, in many schools, we see it in our primary school has a range of, of um, uh, learning needs as well. Where we do see that, it's the quality of learning and teaching that okay. really so matters. So you, think, you think it's entirely, it's the same thing to be taught higher physics in a class with 20 other people doing higher physics as opposed to being in a class with somebody doing National 4, National 5 and advanced higher alongside you? Potentially, the learning experience in in uh, in bi level, tri level teaching can be very good. Oh, I have no doubt about that. That yes. people, but is it the same? It have you done a quality and impact assessment on a young person doing higher physics in a class with twenty peers, also doing higher physics, as opposed to a tri level class? There's certainly, tri level classes have been going for a long, long time in in, in small schools um, where they've always had. Um, S4 to S6 sometimes mm -hmm. in, in, in the same class. Is it, it more is, or less? I wouldn't is know it, that. Is that it, you don't know whether it's, it's an increased frequency or not? I would not know, you don't know that, that. the national overview and of that. We don't, don't have teacher numbers in every school is and class assess, information. Right, so we don't know that. Is there an assessment done then on where geographically these... I mean, I accept rural, remote, fragile communities. understand that and also understand that schools make some individual choices. But if you're talking about a young person in Glasgow, depending on which school they go to, are more or less likely to be in a tri-level class or a class where everybody's doing the one subject. Do you have any assessment of whether that makes any difference or not to that young person's learning? We would when we're in school doing an inspection. Yes, okay. we would have that at that time. But only at, you, would, you would not extrapolate that from a policy which says we would think it would be better for a young person to be or for the teacher or whomsoever, it would be better in terms of outcomes 
for the young person to be taught in a class where they're only doing one level. No, we don't have that level so of analysis. You wouldn't assess that? No. And you wouldn't, in terms of educational policy, have a view on that? It, what happens in the classroom is really what matters in there, because you, you could have a policy, but actually, um, even if you had one person, one, um, one teacher, one cohort of pupils in there, if this teaching could still not be as good as having a, a, a bi-level, well, tri-level teaching. With respect, to understand important that. Element. That's the inspection role. I'm asking you about education policy. Does Education Scotland have a view in a, in a perfect world? Mm -hmm whether there are a consequence to a young person being taught in a tri-level class as opposed to a one-level class. No. You have no view on that. In because because our inspection evidence... Because no, I'm not asking you about inspection. But if, if you'd let me finish, policy. our inspection evidence drives the, the research base should drive our advice and our policy. That's absolutely... We have to be clear and articulate about that. We do not have a substantial body of evidence for our secondary inspection that shows that is either a hindrance or a success because we do inspect and we're inspecting you know and we've got a back catalogue of, a, of a, a number of inspections that if that was coming up on a repeating factor as a significant issue of course we would be reporting on that and we would be then talking about that and raising that as an issue with a variety of partners and stakeholders including policy makers we do not have anything coming out on a recurrent basis from our inspections that's showing that that is either, you know, hugely successful in a model that should be developed in some subjects but not in others, or conversely, um, is, is, is having a negative effect. Could if we did, of course, we would take that forward. Would it be worth you doing the research? Asking teachers, ask a physics teacher how easy it is to teach at trial levels as opposed we, to one level. Yeah. And we, I accept... I accept that there's a quality of the teachers involved in this, but surely there must at least logic would tell you that perhaps some teachers are doing extremely well despite the circumstances in which they find themselves and not be, they're not being... Would, I mean, it seems evident to me that there are young people in some parts of Glasgow will be obliged to do their higher physics with, if not in a consortium, away in another school with a consequence for that, but even inside the school, are not getting the same experience as a child in another school. And I'm asking you whether it's something you would at least look at in terms of equality impact. Because if you're already disadvantaged in your learning, and you're then learning, you know, so even in a school with a, a, a big sixth year, say a fifth year, doing higher physics, so you might even have those who are aspiring to do the very highest, a medium and a lowest class, all doing higher. In another school, you're in with 20 other young people, some of whom are doing one qualification, somebody's doing something else. Is it, are you willing to look at the research, what the impact that is on the teacher, on a young person's well-being, and the outcomes for them of those two different set of circumstances? We are always listening to the sector. We're always having conversations. We've just rearranged ourselves to be able to do that on a more regular basis. From the autumn term, we're going to have big conversations on important educational issues with teachers. We're co-constructing the agenda for those going forward across the summer term. If that is something that the profession feels they want to talk about and engage with, of course we will. That's okay. our role. So but it could be part of those big conversations. But we are engaging with the profession around what are the big topics that they wish to grapple with going forward. One of which is curriculum design, which actually we really need to spend some time having practitioners really collectively think about the future and the offer across the country and locally for their young people. A another one is actually about how professional learning and professional leadership develops across Scotland, where actually those decisions would be evaluated at a local level and driven forward. Mm -hmm. So we'll certainly commit to having asking, asking in those conversations, is that a subject people want to engage and have a conversation about? And if they do, we'd certainly do that because we want to facilitate addressing some of these big issues in Scottish education. I, mean, I would be interested in establishing how many um, of these tri-level classes, bi-level classes exist and in what subjects because teachers will also tell you that actually, even from my own recollection while I was still teaching, general science, standard grade science at general foundation level was a completely different beast from doing physics or chemistry or biology as a subject. They were completely different subjects and, and that actually applies in other subjects as well and I wonder whether you have 
you would look at that, but I, I would urge you, regardless of whether anybody raises it with you or not, if, if you're committed to equality in education, to at least examine whether we disproportionately have bi-level and tri-level classes in poor and disadvantaged communities, and an assessment of the consequence of that for those young people and for the, and for the, the, the teachers who are trying to do that with them, and an assessment of what clustering of subjects are coming under this by tri-level. Is it disproportionately languages? Is it disproportionately signs? And other consequences to that as well? OK, um, I think that ends questions from uh, the committee. Uh, can I thank you all for your attendance at committee today? I'm going to uh, suspend until 14 minutes past. Just a quick comfort break if people could be back in their seats and that will allow the panel to get in place as well. Thank you.
Good morning, and uh, can I welcome our second panel of representatives from Highlands and Islands Enterprise and Higher and Further Education Providers. Thank you very much for your patience. We're on a little bit on in our first session this morning, but you're very welcome this morning. Can I welcome Alistair Sim, Director of University Scotland, Scott Harrison, Associate Director Learning Journey, City of Glasgow College, representing Colleges Scotland, and Morvan Cameron, Head of Universities Education and Skills Highlands and Islands Enterprise, and also Dr. Marsali Niklodj, Vice Principal and Director of Studies at Solmore Ostig. Thank you. Very welcome. Uh, and I'll move straight to questions. I'm going to go to Miss Mackay first. Can you go to someone else? Oh, right, certainly. Miss um, uh, uh, Smith. <laughs> um, uh, could I direct my first question to uh, Alistair Sim? Um, you, you heard, I think, the evidence that we took this morning. You've obviously seen the committee papers where there is very considerable concern about the uh, reduction in the availability of um, a vast majority of subjects. Actually, there is a lot of concern about that. As things stand just now, Mr Sim, have you had um, or are you aware of discussions uh, within the university sector about the implications of this? Um, I, I it's obviously something that, that, that you know, we're, we're dealing with as one of the factors in the landscape and how do we respond to that. I, mean, I think um, from conversations that, that I've had around the sector at the moment, you know, obviously there is concern that some students in some schools, particularly in more deprived areas, are not having the range of opportunity yeah. um, that you'd expect them to have uh, at National 5 higher and, and advanced higher um, and that their opportunities for um, progression are, are, are being diminished by that. I um, mean, your, your evidence is clear on, on that, for instance, of the 18% fall in modern languages um, at um, SEQF um, level five. So um, th these are issues of concern. I think that, that when you're looking at it from a higher education perspective, part of the, 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 the issue is, well, what do you do um, to actually um, address that potential reduction of opportunity for, for, for learners in the senior phase? Um, so there are a lot of things going on. We know you, your evidence cites that the Glasgow Caledon and Hi Advanced Higher Sub is an opportunity to increase opportunity for um, people from schools that can't offer the full curriculum that, that you might expect. Um, there are other examples, for instance, access to professions programmes that various um, universities are running to enable people to come in and actually build up the academic knowledge that they need um, to succeed in, in, in a demanding programme if they haven't had the opportunity to gain that. Um, at university, programmes like Harriet Watt Scholar Programme or Open Universities Young Applicants at Schools Programme to sort of open up online um, a wider range of learning opportunities. So, you know, I think our response is to, you know, recognise that there is an issue uh, that particularly um, learners from the less privileged backgrounds may not have as rich an access um, to opportunities for, for qualifications as you might hope they have and that we are um, having to respond creatively in ways that enable opportunity for people for, for whom it may have been restricted at school level. Are you aware within the evidence, I mean you just mentioned uh, modern languages there, are you aware of um, particular difficulties in other subjects? Um, well I think that the, the, your evidence also for instance cites some focus groups that Glasgow Caledonian University did looking at access to, to science subjects and there are, there are certainly some, there appear to be schools within which it is difficult to, to study three sciences. Um, at advanced higher, and again, you know that there are plenty of choices you can make at university. They don't require you to have free sciences, but nonetheless, I think, for instance, in pathways to medicine and, and the access programmes um, to medicine that are being designed, there's a conscious effort by universities to say, well, there may be some people of real ability um, who haven't had the breadth of curricular opportunity at school, um, but who could be great doctors, great vets, or whatever, and we, we need to do a bit of retro engineering. Um, to make sure that at university we're creating access pathways that enable them to realise their full potential. Can, can I just pursue that point, uh, uh, Mr Sim, because I think that's a very important one. Is, is there evidence within the sector that the first year courses in universities uh, are having to be tailored to address a growing number of youngsters who may be coming in uh, to the university sector without perhaps some of the qualifications that previous generations might have had in particular areas. So you're having to spend a, a bit more of first year, perhaps um, imparting the knowledge and the skills that you would have done uh, in the past. Is, is that fair? I, I don't think I'm seeing that as a norm. Um, and you know, I may not be sort of deeply pedagogically qualified to, to, to comment, but I don't think I'm seeing that a norm. I think, I think what I'm seeing more 
is um, that there are exceptions, for instance, pathways, professions programs, um, access to medicine programs, um, the, the, the academy model um, at Green Margaret, where actually in recognition of um, not everyone having the full range of opportunity at school, the university is getting more engaged in actually creating a, a breadth of opportunity so that people of real potential, whatever their background, are, are able to, to succeed at university. And, and could I just finish on the point of uh, advanced hires, where uh, quite clearly we know from the statistics that have been compiled by uh, various um, bodies that the availability of advanced hires is pretty patchy, actually. Particularly, uh, there are concerns, I think Mr Greer uh, raised this uh, issue uh, in the previous session, about some of the more deprived communities. And, you know, there are hubs that can deal with some of that up to a point, but there are other areas where it's virtually impossible for a youngster uh, to be able to do an advanced hire because um, their, not just their school, but their area can't provide that. Is that a matter of concern for you about the sort of the squeeze on advanced hires? Um, yeah, I, I think one would wish to see equality of opportunity where, wherever one lives. Um, but I think the way the university responds to this is, is that particular, you know, the, the hire remains essentially um, the core qualification for university entry. I mean, you couldn't make advanced hire the normal core qualification for university entry for reasons that include the fact that so many students do not have the, the, the capacity to study um, a wide range Despite of it being hires. very well recognised, it's one of the best qualifications that Scotland does. It's, it's, a, it's a really excellent exam, but you know, we, we, we have a system um, that um, at school level um, really enables most students to be able to study a reasonable range of hires, um, but doesn't support um, a wide range of students um, to, to be able to study three advanced hires. I think when we looked in the Learner Journey Review at the proportion of um, learners getting three advanced hires, it was tiny. It was about 2.6% of, of, of school leavers. Thank you. Ms. McCann. Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning. Um, yes, I just wonder, wonder if you could tell us um, what, to what extent the, the widening of education providers in the senior phase at school, we heard about collaboration with colleges, etc., from the previous panel is improving the outcomes for young people and whether or not you think vocational courses such as foundation apprenticeships and uh, such have displaced entries to the national four and uh, national three qualifications and if there's an impact on that do you have any comment on that um i, I don't have any specific data on that um i can tell you that we are expanding uh our offer so, for example, in the Glasgow region, we are going to be offering a level four or five pre-foundation apprenticeship next year in construction, automotive, and hospitality. So, I, I couldn't comment from schools if, yeah. if that's displacing, mm -hmm. but there's, there's more on offer mm -hmm. for, for pupils in schools. Mm -hmm. And is, in your view, it, that's obviously improving outcomes for young people. Is that something that's going to keep keep on growing? Is it something that's going to be brought forward? I believe so, because this is a pilot that uh, ran in a couple of schools the year previous. Mm -hmm. Now we're adding it to the three Glasgow Regional Colleges. Um, there are also some level six pilots that are going to be running next year. Mm -hmm. we're, at my college, we're not going to be doing that for the first year, so I can't comment on yeah. that. Mm -hmm. But I would say it is expanding. Mm -hmm. You're talking about Glasgow colleges. Is this happening throughout Scotland? Do you know? Does anyone know? Is it, or is it up to each individual college to, to introduce these uh, courses? I, I can only comment on our region. Yeah. I don't want to speak out of turn. Yeah. Yes. If I could just add that at Slomaroff Steg, um, the National um, Centre for Gaelic Language and Culture, we're offering two foundation apprenticeships next year. We're offering one this year to senior five and senior six pupils. Okay and through the medium of Gaelic, which is what we do. Mm -hmm. And that, therefore, is widening the choice mm -hmm. of pupils in our local school in Portree, for example, currently, mm -hmm. to have a Gaelic medium subject in the senior phase. Okay. And in a school which currently only offers three subjects mm -hmm. through the medium of Gaelic in the senior mm -hmm. phase. Did you say you're currently <coughs> doing that, or you're planning to? We're currently offering one foundation apprent um, apprenticeship in uh, children and young people. And we'll be offering two, the second one in um, creative digital media as of next year as well. What's the, what's the take up on the Gaelic one? Uh, we have this year nine pupils in Portree and in Procton High Schools 
engaged in our foundation apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. So that for us a, is a really good take up. That's a, that's a good take up. That's yeah. what you were anticipating. Yeah, that's that's, that's, a, that's beyond what we were anticipating. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, I think um, you know it's, it's it's great to have diverse routes, routes to attainment because um, you know people, young people, people of any age have have got very diverse um, aspirations and talents. So so you know I, I think we welcome. Um, that growth, and I think you know the fact that, um, for instance, universities are offering more graduate-level apprenticeships. Um, that we're um, getting closer and closer with colleges and making sure that articulation pathways from um, HN to, to university study um, are, are working effectively. I think this all helps to provide multiple routes for learners with, with multiple aspirations mm -hmm. and, and talents. Um, I think the one thing that would concern me is if um, you know we're. Get, I hope we're not heading towards a situation. Um, where you know schools in a privileged area, you, you you've got a good range of hires, advanced hires. That that route is easy. Schools in a less privileged area, you know, you're, you're, there's more sort of DYW provision um, and more of a sense that, that that we can give you opportunities through through that route, but but not so much through the um, through, through the route through hires and advanced hires because um, I think they're all valuable, and I just don't yeah. think um, where you're at school um, should determine. Um, which of these routes is, is open to you? We, we were exploring this with Education Scotland um, because we think that's very important too. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we still have to get some definite answers on that. Thank you. Mr. Gray. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mr. Gray, please. Um, uh, uh, it's kind of a follow on from that because a lot of the evidence we heard uh, <coughs> from Education Scotland around the, the changes to the senior phase were about flexibility and personalisation. And an aspect of that is um, they were telling us, I think, that we had to get away from the old fashioned mindset of doing, um, you know, your, your uh, what would have been standard grades, now national exams, and then your hires in S5, and maybe advanced higher in S6, that um, students might, um, skip stages in certain subjects. They might do some hires in one year and other hires in another year, all of that. Um, so what I wanted to ask really, and I, I guess it's for, for Alistair Sim in particular, is does that not mean that universities will have to look at um, their entry qualifications because there are st um, achieving your qualifications at a single sitting is still an element of requirement, at least for some institutions. Um, and it might be the case if schools are, are developing the way we heard described that, um, I, I mean, I could be a very uh, able uh, young person in a school which is not particularly deprived or anything like that, but because of the way the curriculum is designed, I simply cannot uh, do all the hires I need for the course that I want to do in a single sitting. So is, are the universities looking at addressing that? Um, I think that's absolutely fair. Um, I mean, I think how I'd characterise a single sitting requirement now is it's very much an exception rather than a norm. I think as, as a matter of generality, um, universities recognise that the, the, the flexibility of the senior phase means that people may well be accumulating qualifications um, over a number of years. Um, I think there are some courses, I mean, you've, from your evidence, you've seen this particularly in, in, in medicine, for instance, where Essentially, I think the rationale is that the, the course is one that requires extreme academic rigour, and so they're looking for the, the learner to demonstrate extreme academic rigour of having undertaken uh, a substantial diet of exams in one year, or if they spread them over two years, saying you actually need to achieve slightly better grades over two years um, than if you'd done them in one sitting. So I'm, I'm not going to say it's unfair. I can see why they're, they're doing that. Um, but I do think, as a generality, um, the, the principles of, of Scottish University entry are, that, uh, are to look um, at the qualifications attained over a senior phase um, rather than in a, in a single sitting. The, uh, the, the related question, I suppose, would be, um, and, and you, you kind of alluded to this um, a, a little bit in response, I, I think, to Liz Smith, the degree to which the universities are, I mean, again, Education Scotland argued that our old-fashioned um, uh, kind of um, failure to, to re change our mindset away from uh, traditional qualifications didn't recognise um, a range of short courses, uh, vocational courses, Saltire Prize, Duke of Edinburgh, all of that. Mm. Are the universities looking at any formal way of actually recognising that kind of attainment alongside 
higher as, as, as part of entry qualification? Um, certainly looking at a wider range of attainment, for instance, uh, for courses where the content is relevant, um, I think the majority of universities are now looking at the foundation apprenticeship um, as an entrance qualification, um, broadly equivalent to higher. Um, I think when you get into things like um, Duke of Edinburgh and so on, I mean, what, what have you attained outside the, the formal curriculum, you get into some quite tricky territory of social capital. Um, because there are you know, many learners who have had a home background that has enabled them to do Duke of Edinburgh Rally Project, whatever, to um, get you know, easy access to internships that can demonstrate professional expertise. So this is one of the things we're thinking through, is how is a personal statement used for admissions purposes? I think you know, a personal <coughs> statement that, that shows you're committed to learning, committed to your subject, is fine. A personal statement that is used in a kind of social capital divisive way to say, actually, I've had a privileged upbringing, I've got my gold Duke of Edinburgh, um, I've um, had an internship in a law firm, yeah. um, I think is socially divisive. So you have to be qu quite careful, I think, about, uh, about how you recognise those, those, those wider achievements. Have, have you looked at all, I mean, I don't know very much about this, but I believe in Wales they have the, the Welsh Baccalaureate, which is a very different thing from mm -hmm. the Scottish Baccalaureate, which tries to do some of that broader rec recognition of attainment. I don't know if you've ever looked at that system. Um, I, my, my first job in 1989 was um, in, in government was looking at a baccalaureate model um, and I think at that stage um, it was considered a bit politically difficult. I um, don't think it's really come back big time. Well, I think um, the Welsh I mean, model is a merit. different one. It's, yeah. it's more uh, a, a, a qualification that encompasses some of these less formal things. But I, anyway, I mean, I, I can really see, you know, I can see the merits of, of that and, you know, there's an international baccalaureate that is used by um, a number of schools. I think recognising a breadth of attainment is a really good thing to do. I mean, it's one of the things we're trying to do at university level is we're not just teaching a subject, we're consciously trying to develop a set of graduate attributes about analytical ability, team working, um, confidence, resilience, you know, etc. Um, and I think it's right that schools also um, are trying to, to develop a wider set of attributes than, than simply subject knowledge without detriment to subject knowledge. So, you know, if these things um, can be captured in a way that um, is, uh, gives everyone a quality of opportunity, then, then I think there's, there's a wealth there. Um, I was really just commenting earlier that there are some ways of capturing experience outside the curriculum that, that, that can be a bit socially divisive. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could I just um, clarify on that? In the, the evidence from Education Scotland, uh, I know you were and for part of the, the session um, as an observer, Mr. Sim, it, it was that the the curriculum for excellence is more than just the subjects. The curriculum for excellence includes all these additional um, short courses, Duke of Edinburgh and all of those things. But from if I'm interpreting it right, you still see subject choices as a minimum and those as maybe di differentiators in addition to someone's experience. Um, Would that be right? I, I think what I'm trying to say is that, that you know, your ability to present a good range of, of qualifications um, is, is kind of core to university entry. One of the good things about Curriculum for Excellence, and I think it's something that, that resonates very strongly with what we're trying to do at university, um, is that you are, um, through the, the experience of, of, of Curriculum for Excellence, developing those broader attributes as well as subject knowledge. And I think that is, you know, helping to create people who, who've got a rounded expertise um, as well as, as subject knowledge. So I mean, entirely supportive of, of that intention. And, and one of the things that became evident in the last session as well was, well, we have very good statistics on standard grade, higher grade, advanced higher qualifications, or NAT 5s and NAT 4s as they would be now, sorry. <laughs> Going back to an, an older time, but while we have statistics on those qualifications, we're not seem to be capturing something that education Scotland would say is core to the curriculum. Does that cause you concerns and be able to assess going forward? Um, I guess this comes into how do you look at the whole set of information you have in, in, in the application to, to university. So, you know, you've got the information on the exams, um, you've got the personal statement, you've got the reference from the school or, or, or previous education provider. Um, you may have evidence of socioeconomic um, disadvantage you're taking account of as well. So, you know, it's not mechanistic. You, you we're, we're, you know, you, we're looking at um, a set of information 
about the individual and whether a course the, the individual has applied for um, is going to be um, a good choice for them. Obviously, there are some things in that, some of the sort of more abstract qualities that are, that are harder to capture, but I think it is an admission system that, that is um, broader than simply a mechanistic look at, at what you've attained in terms of exam level. And Mr. Harrison, would you have a, a perspective? I just wanted to, to uh, add my two cents, if I could, from my personal experience, not to detract from universities, but I've worked with students from a wide range of levels and backgrounds, additional support needs, adult returners who may have no or outdated qualifications, quite a wide range, uh, high achievers at school. And we have to remember curriculum for excellence is about skills for learning life and work as we all know. So not everyone is gonna go to university. So when we have um, you know, wider, widening access, uh, alternative awards and qualifications, you mentioned Duke of Edinburgh or short courses or national threes, fours, fives. Um, I think it's important that we um, recognize those and that they might not necessarily be using those to go on to university, but to go into further education, employment or, or training. And they, I value those when I'm looking at a student's application just as much as I would a higher or advanced higher. Um, I'm going to move to Dr. Alwyn. Okay, thank you, convener. Um, this committee, as well as having responsibility for Gaelic in schools, is responsibility for Gaelic as a language and its future as a language. So um, I'm keen to know what the, um, what the people in, uh, in, the, in the panel today, particularly probably Marshall and Nicholas George, um, what they feel about the recent picture of, of uh, Gaelic as a subject, both learners and fluent Gaelic uh, in fourth year. I believe, Dr Allen. Um, thank you very much, Dr Allen. Um, thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here today and to contribute evidence to you. Um, I'd just like to pick up on some of the points raised at the last session uh, when you were looking for the figures and just to draw some figures to the attention of those present that we've actually seen, according to Professor Jim Scott's figures, a decline on 57% of pupils sitting that three to fives in Gaelic uh, for learners and of 17.3% for fluent speakers. And in that six, a decline in 27% for Gaelic for learners and um, a marginal increase for Gaelic for um, fluent speakers. So, and if we look at the attainment figures, according to what I've looked at, we've seen a decrease of 40% in um, Gaelic higher for learners, decrease of 40% of pupils studying for Gaelic learners, and that's since 2012. So the decreases are quite stark in the number of um, particularly Gaelic learners who are undertaking qualifications um, within the school and the senior phase. And this is incredibly worrying for us. Um, I speak on behalf of Somber Ostig, the National Centre for Gaelic Language and Culture, um, we're a, an academic partner of the University of the Highlands and Islands. And at Solmer Ostig, in, and uh, together with our colleagues at College of Castle, um, Lewes Castle College in Stornoway, we train the future uh, Gaelic medium teachers, the future Gaelic medium broadcasters, those who are working in, in public uh, policy and affairs for Gaelic. And what we believe is that this narrowing in the curriculum is having a very adverse effect on the number of pupils who have the choice to study Gaelic. And we were um, discussing, we heard earlier today in the previous session about choice of pupils. Um, one of our concerns is, do pupils have an informed choice? We welcome the fact there's flexibility in this curriculum for excellence, uh, but also how informed are pupils' choices and the choices they make? Uh, to what extent are pupils having to make choice between Gaelic and other subjects, such as a science subjects and other, if you like, facilitating subjects uh, when they go into um, secondary four. That, that's of concern to us. And also, um, just to pick up on a previous point, well, perhaps they have the, the opportunity to study, for example, um, a Gaelic National Five in the senior, later on in the senior phase, well, I have the figures from this year looking at the school. We've done some um, research with schools at Solmarostig. Um, sorry, sorry Solmarostig has done some research with schools. And what we see is that there are very few pupils 
who, who are learning Gaelic, who go on to study um, for a National 5 in, the, in, in S5 or S6. And that's because for learning language, continuity is so important. So if we want to promote and increase the number of Gaelic speakers um, through the Gaelic Learner Education in Scotland, we need that continuity of learning. Okay, mm -hmm. you, you've anticipated one or two of my questions, actually. That's a very helpful, very full answer. In that case, can I ask specifically um, on one point that came up in the last conversation, the last panel, was are we talking here about a situation that's driven by teacher shortage in schools or is this all about the structure of columns and the choices that people are asked to make? Well, I think it's important to bear in mind that Gaelic education is a minority language education. It's got very distinct needs and it's a national priority. And the reason we have such success in our Gaelic medium education in Scotland, such growth since the 80s, is because of this collaboration, collaboration between local authorities and national government in response to parental demand for Gaelic medium education. And I believe that we still need that level of prioritisation at a national level. Um, we would need, I think we need to look at a broad range of factors that may be influencing the trend. I don't have the actual evidence, but our consultation with schools and pupils suggests to us that teacher shortages is only one factor, it's one important factor, but that um, co competing columns in the school timetable is another important factor. I think we also need to think about, going back to the issue of informed choices, is what information are pupils receiving when they make these choices about Gaelic, for example. Um, so again, I think a national approach is needed to ensure that we're informing pupils of their choices when they choose Gaelic as a subject at school, for example, as a, as a qualification, and what are the opportunities in the workplace with Gaelic, for example. And the opportunities are great. We cannot meet, of course, the demand in the Gaelic labour market for, okay. for pupils with high-level language skills. Well, well, thinking of that, and given that, um, although you, you've mentioned there, teacher shortage is only one factor in, in the choices that pupils are, or young people are making, um, you've also pointed to the fact that there will be, or there already is, uh, a shortage of, of people to fill places in Gaelic essential jobs, not least teaching. So I suppose this one is as much for Alistair Sim as it is for yourself. Um, what are the, the implications for um, higher education institutions, whether that's Salma Rostic or universities, teacher, initial teacher education institutions, if the people coming out of school with uh, Gaelic qualifications has suddenly declined? Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm honestly not going to pretend to, to a great expertise on, on this front, but um, you know, clearly um, we are part of an educational pipeline. Um, and um, if um, you know, people um, are not coming up from school with the knowledge that will enable them to do a particular degree course, you know, whether it's um, in, initial teacher education in, in, in Gaelic or, or whatever, then that opportunity is, is, is lost to them. I mean, we, we are, you know, plenty of things you can start first time at university. I mean, very few people will, for instance, have done higher psychology, they may choose to do, go on and do psychology at university. There, there, are, there are plenty of courses that are designed um, to take someone who's got a really good breadth of education and introduce them to a new subject and take them on. But, um, you know, there are also real difficulties um, in um, taking someone on for, for certain courses if they simply don't have the prior educational attainment. Thank you. Um, if I could just add to that, I think the consequences, the, the implications are very serious for us. Um, in, if we are to fill the ambitions as a nation that we have in terms of delivering um, Gaelic medium education, in terms of growing Gaelic medium education in, this, in, this <coughs> second, in the secondary phase and the senior phase as well, and if we're serious about maintaining what is still a very fragile minority language community, then we need to seriously consider how we might increase resources and prioritise Gaelic as a subject within the school um, curriculum. And we're we're at the stage now, we, we do have, we have ways in which we, we want to be as flexible as possible. We have different degree programmes available to any um, young person or adult wishing to become a Gaelic teacher. At Salmer Ostig we offer a four year um, BA programme and we have 
there's a, a, a Gaelic degree programme at Edinburgh University in which Somerosti contributes to. It's a five-year programme which enables students with very little Gaelic to become qualified over the course of five years to become Gaelic medium teachers. So we have these options available. The numbers are still small and they are insufficient to meet the demand and the predicted demand for Gaelic medium um, teachers. So it's, it's an issue of, I would say, of grave concern. And I think it goes back to my point about, um, I think we need to consider the special case that we need to make for Gaelic as a minority language. Um, we heard earlier about we, we aspire in Scotland for um, our pupils to become global citizens, well also Scottish citizens. We want to increase the number of pupils who have a choice to study Gaelic within the school curriculum and to increase the number of um, teachers that are able to deliver that curriculum, particularly within the, in the senior phase. Yeah, I would just simply add to that in terms of Highlands Islands Enterprise and the work and the importance of Gaelic to our, our region um, that we would be really concerned about that drop in numbers and, and that pipeline, that valuable pipeline we have coming through the system to support the opportunities for Gaelic employment in the region. So it is really concerning. Okay, um, I'm going to go to Miss Lamont. Just, uh, it was really um, following on from the, the, this issue about subject choice, the range of choice that some young people have as against others, and therefore the consequence then for their choices at a later stage. Um, I wondered whether there's been any analysis of, we know that, I think the figures show that more young people from more deprived backgrounds are now going on to higher education. Do we have figures on the proportions going via college to university and whether they're poorer, youngsters from poorer backgrounds disproportionately represented there, but also in what courses they're succeeding in getting into. So theoretically, we could be in a, a level playing field, but disproportionately young people from poorer backgrounds are not accessing law, medicine, whatever. And I wonder whether there's been any analysis done of that. Um, there was, I, I couldn't give you all the figures off the top of my head. Um, but um, illustratively, um, I think now about 16% of entrants to higher education universities um, are coming from the most deprived 20% postcodes. I think the figure um, for people doing higher education at college level um, is a bit over 20%. So, you know, there, there's, there's a similarity, but there's also a, a gap. I think there is still um, a pattern that um, if you're from a more socio socioeconomically deprived background, um, you, know, the, the, you, you are slightly more likely to go to college um, than to, to university at higher education level. Um, and that, obviously that's, that's a good, viable route for, for, for many people and, and one that we are very supportive of growing. Um, the Commissioner on Widening Access published a paper where he looked at admission to various um, subject levels and attainment in those subject levels um, I would have to, to look that out and um, send it back to, to the committee just to sort of give the, the quantified evidence of who's going in, into what subject. Um, I think one thing I did note, and again I'd have to go back and look for evidence of this, is that the fastest growing success rate of applicants um, to do medicine is um, from the most deprived uh, backgrounds. Um, uh, yeah, but you know, there has been um, a really remarkable success over the past few years in the increase in proportion of um, students um, coming into medicine from the most deprived backgrounds. But again, I, I would have to go back and um, actually so, look so at the data on that and send that. I suppose my point is so there may be progress in that because you've, there's been active initiatives to do that. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, obviously there's an issue about the extent to which um, SIMD represents simply, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, it may be a category where youngsters from very poor backgrounds don't necessarily live in these communities, but, um, and I accept that, but is there work done round, if our contention is there's a limiting of choice, so there's limiting of subjects um, mm. in, in our schools, and my contention to be tested, that that disproportionate affects poorer communities, I'm just interested whether that then starts feeding through into where young people from poorer backgrounds end up in the higher education system. I, I will go back and look at the evidence on that. I, mean, I think that there is evidence that there is a bit of a difference in um, subject choice or where, where, which subject one ends up in. Um, 
you know, again, I think it's chopped down by the SAIMD indicator, which, as he recognises, is not entirely adequate, but it's illustratively useful. So, you know, while there has been progress and a lot of work put in by higher education institutions to, to get um, people from the most challenged backgrounds um, into the most selective courses, um, I, I, you know, I, I'm not going to pretend that it's a it's a work that is yet complete or that there aren't challenges because of um, people from schools in, in, in the more challenged backgrounds not having access to the range of qualifications that some of their more privileged peers have. So, but I will, I will look at the evidence on where, where people are, are going. Just finally then, so for example, if there's evidence that fewer and fewer young people are taking um, languages and disproportionately from poorer communities are less likely to take languages, is this playing itself through in terms of a, the number of graduates in languages out of our universities and our education more generally, is that decreasing? And I of that cohort, I suppose the question is, where are these young people coming from? Uh, of the cohort, I mean, I think if, if we can look at the information as to what the SIMD proportion is of people going into different subject areas, that, that, that'll broadly tell us. Um, I don't think we're yet seeing that um, we're, we're not able to fill the places on modern languages courses, but I think that more reflects the fact that, you know, we're, we're in a capped system. There's only a fixed number of places avail available for Scottish domicile students. Um, so there are more qualified applicants um, for the courses um, than, than, than there are places. So even if you saw a diminishment of applicants, and I don't know, but I, I couldn't give you a figure on that off the top of my head, um, even if there were a diminishment of applicants, there would probably still be a sufficient pool of well-qualified applicants to fill the places. Be able to assess where these, uh, those who are successful are coming from and whether, therefore, that, that it's playing out through you know, in terms of access to particular courses like languages may be disproportionately affecting poorer communities. I, 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 would have to look, I, would, I would genuinely have to look and see what's available on that. I think at the aggregate level, um, across all subjects, what we've seen is that year on year over recent years, um, the success rate of applicants from um, the most challenged backgrounds um, has gone up faster than the success rate of applicants uh, from the, the more privileged backgrounds. Okay, thank you. Mr Scott? Thank you. Um, Joanne Lamont's points about um, uh, the university sector, Mr. Sim, uh, and their requirements on access and widening access. With your point about um, your point that you've just made about the cap on number of places for Scottish students, uh, with narrowing uh, choice in secondary at the senior phase, are all those three things meaning? How? So, a better question: um, How are Scottish universities assessing uh, students from Scotland? for a particular application for a particular course as opposed to students who come from out with Scotland given all those factors that you've just mentioned um, and is it having an impact I suppose is the obvious question yeah um, be because you're dealing with a, with, with a system of fixed numbers in a sense you're, you're dealing with different pools of, of, of applicants um, so you know you have to fill your Scottish places you want to fill your Scottish places it's intrinsic to the mission of the, the institution that we're, we're, we're doing something for the society that we're um, located in, um, so you know you're, you're looking to fill those with the best qualified students. You, you know, I've described already sort of the ways in which, through looking at the exams, looking at contextual information, looking at the personal statement, the reference from the the, the school, um, you're trying to make a fair decision for each student. You're also trying to attract the very best students you can from the rest of the UK, from the EU, um, from, um, them, from 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 in, in, international, um, but. Um, you know, I think particularly when you look at the rest of UK and um, international students, the recruitment of you know great students from those backgrounds is not something that's done to the detriment of the opportunity that, that we can provide for for Scottish students. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I you know we, basically if we didn't fill our Scottish student numbers, a we'd be um, I think uh, betraying our our mission, and b we'd be fined. But you're, you've made the very fair point that actually we're way over on Scottish student numbers, aren't we? In most co in well, you tell me in most courses. Also, you just mentioned languages and said we're we're not Scottish universities are not potentially fulfilling their cohort on on uh, students from Scotland for those courses. Uh, no, no, I think we are. I mean, what we're saying is there are more applicants um, yeah, than there are places. Exactly. There are, um, so, so that bit's not we, the problem, is it? Yeah, that bit is it. It's, it's, if there were obviously, if there were more places for Scottish oh, students, we could take on we could take on more qualified students. But um, we would be concerned if that were done at the cost of the resource per student. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think 
Um, one in the context of this inquiry, which is about narrowing choice, yeah. is narrowing choice having an impact on these decisions that universities are being asked to make about the relative merits of a, of a candidate from Scotland as opposed to a candidate from out West Scotland? Um, I don't think so, because yeah. I don't think we are considering those relative merits. I think we're saying here, here, here are the places we have available for, for our SFC-funded students. Now let's make sure that we're um, applying those uh, places fairly in a way that recognises potential um, okay. and that we are you know, okay. discharging admission. I think you're, you're, no, that's fair. That's yeah. entirely fair. Just one last question, if I may, Kavina, and that was your point that you made earlier on, I think, to Liz Smith about, about um, Scottish students at, um, possibly taking the range of courses over two years rather than one. Edinburgh asks, I'm just picking Edinburgh, Edinburgh asks five A's at one sitting for law. You can't really get past that, can you? Uh, I, I think that that's, I mean, it, it's an exception. Okay. Um, I think, how would you justify that? I mean, you, uh, essentially... I'm not um, planning to go to Edinburgh, I'm just saying that's what they're asking, yeah. is it not? Um, and some I mean, students in the Scottish schools will not be able to do those five at yeah. one and sitting. I, and I think you should have the opportunity to, to say, look, we're, we're at a school that has yeah. a, a, broad, a, a senior phase that doesn't enable to do that, so yes. it needs need special consideration. I think just setting it a norm is in a, is in a way of, it, it's, it's rationing. Again, coming back to that point that there are many more applicants sure. than there are places, sure. you, you, you set the bar quite high, also recognising the fact it's a course of a high level of, of intellectual demand. Um, but I do think there's also um, an onus on a system to, to recognise that not every school has got a senior phase um, that supports students to make those choices and, and, and has to retain an openness to um, the qualifications mm. that, that students are able to, to present who've come from um, a school with a senior phase that has deliberately built their qualifications over a number of years. Thank you. Mr. Mandel. Thank you, uh, Convener. I wondered, uh, Alison, really if you would commit to undertaking the same uh, exercise in, in terms of rurality um, and, and look at uh, where, uh, where, where uh, students are coming from uh, for some of these courses, because certainly uh, my sort of anecdotal evidence, speaking to some of your members, particularly uh, within uh, veterinary studies and some aspects of medicine, because I know there are good programmes in place, uh, but those tend to attach themselves to particular schools uh, rather than to, to sort of whole uh, local authority areas. And that, uh, certainly from the evidence we heard from Education Scotland uh, earlier, they, they seem to, it's one of the few things they seem to recognise that there's an issue with, but they, they did seem to I uh, acknowledge there was a narrowing of subject choice in more rural areas. Is that a pattern you see already, and would you would, would you be prepared to look at that? Um, I don't think we would particularly be the source of information on the, the subject choice at rural, at rural levels. Um, I mean, I think I recognise what you're saying that that, that you know from from the evidence you've, you've already seen that that there is a potential restriction of subject choices um, at schools that just don't have the cohort of of students to, to necessarily enable them to be able to resource the breadth of hires and advanced hires that we might have. And I, you know, I think there's, a, there's an equity issue in there. Um, I think, I, I don't honestly know if there's a good information source that could tell me the, the rurality background of the people who are coming into highly selective courses. If, if there is, I'll, 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 you know, I'll ask the funding council if, um, if there is something that would help us with that, but I honestly don't know if there is. I, I, I would think what would tell you that is the number you'll be able to look at the number within medicine, law, uh, veterinary studies, some other very competitive courses, the actual schools uh, that, that young people are coming from and which local authorities they're in. And I think it might not give you, you know, the, the best data, the most robust data, but I, I think there'd be a very strong uh, trend there. And when you're looking um, at, you know, at uh, courses like Law at Edinburgh that are requiring five A's in a single sitting, you know, there are certain schools that will not have sent people you know, to, to do that course, you know, for a number of years, uh, because there are no pupils leaving their school, you know, who are able to who are able to do that because of, you know, what's available on the timetable, and I think that I, I, I think there might be a pattern there. I'd be interested, really, in any any data you were able to. to yeah, to, to I, I, I mean, I'll, I'll look. I mean, don't think we've got data on that. It may have to be collected through institutions, and um, I think we just have to quick look at what what we can do as a proportion on that. But I'd accept the issue. Okay, thank you. Can we do you wanted to, yeah, perhaps just, to, just to add that from the perspective of Hansel's Enterprise, we did some research that was looking into the attitudes and aspirations of our young people. As you would imagine, uh, youth out migration is a, is a big problem for us in the Highlands and Islands, so we're very keen to keep close to what the issues are so that we can respond to them appropriately. 
Um, so the recent piece of research we did in, in 2018 did ask a particular question about uh, young people's uh, view on the selection, the choice opportunities that are available to them. And actually, 71% um, of the 3,100 respondees talked about they're, they're being relatively happy with good or very good provision. Um, but of course, when you get into rural areas, it differentiates slightly and you get a dropping to about 50% in, in some of the, the fragile areas. Of course, we didn't go deeper than that, but you know, you, you, to ask the question as to what's behind that, I, I suspect our, our view on that would be a, is much more to do with a lack of teachers and recruitment difficulties of teachers as opposed to, and small rural schools, where you, to, to give the breadth of coverage is just really, really difficult to do, give or take the fact that there is some, some new technology coming in to try and help with that. Um, but certainly, I think we do feel that. Um, so, so it was just a reflection of what young people's views were of the, the choice that was available to them. That's really interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Greer? Um, I'd be interested in uh, Mr. Harrison's uh, views, your experience of where collaboration <clears throat> between schools and, and colleges has increased over recent years. Um, certainly, from, from what I've seen, there are a huge number of fantastic examples where schools get a lot of added value out of further collaboration with colleges, both bringing college lecturers into the school, perhaps, to, to offer extra subjects and where pupils get the opportunity to, to go to college. But there does seem to be a fair amount of, of anecdotal evidence that's building now of further collaboration between schools and colleges essentially being forced by shortages of teachers in specific subject areas and inability of the school to offer something it would otherwise want to offer. And I'd be interested in your experience of how, how often that's the case, any examples that, that you've seen of it, and if there are particular areas where that collaboration has been forced by a shortage rather than a desire to offer more. Uh, thank you for that question. So at City, we work with over 62 secondary schools in over four local authorities geographically um, you know obviously we can oh, I beg your pardon we can work with different regions um, and we do have uh, close partnerships we have uh, the Glasgow regional regional vocational partnership where we it's an operational group but it's where we meet with the Glasgow City Council and with schools to w just work more closely more collaboratively one area that I can give an example is I believe that there are there's a shortage of home ec teachers and we at City are very strong with professional cookery so we constantly have a high demand in that area and work to support that because many schools can't offer that so we, we have um, in our numbers here a high number that's our highest number is in the hospitality and leisure faculty uh, of applications one thing that I would like to take the opportunity to say is that I think we could improve upon teachers coming into colleges to see what we do and what we have to offer, but vice versa, lecturers going into schools to see, uh, what, you know, they might not have even been in a school before. So, but I think that has to come from a more strategic leadership level um, with head teachers um, and directors of faculties liaising and um, making that happen through CPD. Grant. And so t I think the home economics example is an interesting one, because that's one we're certainly very aware of, aware of really acute shortage of, of teachers there. Um, at what point does that go from an opportunity to a, a challenge for a college? If, if there's increasing demand from the schools and local area for further collaboration, simply because they cannot recruit teachers to offer that subject, are, are there specific areas, for example, maybe home economics, where that is actually becoming a bit of a, a challenge for the college because you, you cannot meet the demand that is essentially being displaced from the school sector while also meeting the obligations you already have? Yes, of course, it's supply and demand, isn't it? So uh, we only have so many, uh, so many staff in that area of professional cookery. We only have so many kitchens and... Um, uh, baking facilities that's not my area of expertise in the kitchen um, and you know there's only so much availability so once you get to to that um, threshold then you know we're not able to offer more we do try to be creative so city is open four evenings a week they're open on the, on Saturdays um, so we, we do try to be in creative with that um, staff also going into schools Another example is um, higher psychology. There's a very high demand for that. 
So we do have teachers going into schools to deliver um, psychology, cooking, PSD, sport and leisure. There's quite quite a, a wide range. But it is, yes, there's, there's only so much you can do in, in a day. Right, thank you very much. Okay, um, sure. can I ask a, a quick final question? It's probably, um, Mr Harris, I think you've probably got the best uh, option to do it. Um, when, when we were working on developing the young workforce, everything was about parity of esteem of um, vocational and different routes into to the workplace uh, as opposed to traditional further and higher education as it, as it was. Um, but we heard a bit today about um, curricular development um, being done by the schools um, in particular to, to meet the needs of their area. I think the word appropriate was used several times by Education Scotland. So if you're in Edinburgh and you've got access to FinTech collaborators or oil and gas in the North East, you know, you've got opportunities there for, for many more things that perhaps post-industrial areas still suffering from degrees of deprivation like some of the parts of Ayrshire and Wellington area in North Lanarkshire. Um, can you see that there's um, a danger that, that, that we're not giving a parity of opportunity to people across the country just because of the, those specific um, uh, appropriate <laughs> decisions that have been taken by schools at a local level? This is just my own personal opinion. I'll preface, that, uh, preface it by saying that. But yes, I do think there is a, a, a danger of parity of esteem because um, Edinburgh and Glasgow do have opportunities that perhaps in the borders or highlands and islands or more remote or, or more deprived areas may not have. Um, there's, you know, budget is quite often what I hear from schools is we, d we just don't have the money. So that could be for the teachers or teacher training or transportation uh, to get students to other schools or even to colleges. Um, so yeah, I, th I think we would be lying if in if we said in some areas there wasn't, a, you know, that that there wasn't a lack of that parity of esteem. So it's something that we ha we have to continue to work collaboratively because we all want the same end goal, and that's for students to have choice and to have a good education. Okay, Miss Cameron, do you want to con you get a comment from the Highlands of Islands perspective with the challenges, particularly in your area? Well, I, I, I guess, yes, in the, everything is a bit more difficult in terms of the distance from the industries. We, we do have a huge number of sort of industries up in the Highlands and Islands, and I, I'm aware, not in specific details, that you know the UHI and its 13 academic partners are working closely and increasingly more closely with the school systems in their local territory to try and find um, you know, collaborative solutions to... to filling the gaps of some delivery and some of the educational offers. And in fact, HIGH itself, al along with partners in the Highland Council and others, um, have created a sort of Science Skills Academy to try and add additional inspirational science support. Um, what we can't do is step in and, and fill the gap of science teachers that are not available within the Highland Council, for instance. Um, we are keen to come in with additionality of, well, wh what more can we do to try and support and augment what they're supposed to be delivering? So, um, yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, you're, you're looking at an area where there are much more challenges around about logistics of getting getting young people to different places and businesses who are not reaching out to small islands etc so whilst it might be uh, appropriate for a school teacher or a head teacher to want to do things they're extremely limited in being able to do that and not, not least of which will be financial limitations as well so there is definitely you know different systems that, that exist across Scotland and it, it, it works better in some places than others. Thank you. Are there any final questions from committee members? So can I, I thank you all for your attendance at committee this morning. It was really helpful. And we now move into private session.